All right. We have another whole new show. And I don't know, like all I've been doing with my whole life is like researching now. Like it's just like turned into like this insane, uh, you know, never ending reading that I'm, I'm doing. I'm, I have like a whole uh, knowledge system that I've set up on my computer here uh, where it's like all integrated into Vivaldi browser and I have like all these plugins and stuff and I have like all my PDFs there and like my note highlighting and like uh, uh, quoting and taking notes and stuff and it's all like feeding into each other and I'm just going on LibGen and like getting books going to wor- world catalog and like going to university library catalogs and like finding bibliographies and everything and like downloading them all from LibGen and then loading them in here and then just like oh my god is but you know I guess you know that's that's what we're up to today because I I feel like logo you said you or now just doing the same thing you're just reading all the time yeah I'm literally just in pre- well I've been doing this for a long time it's like my favorite thing in the world to do so I mean I'm not complaining but uh, yeah I'm just constantly like flicking through PDFs on my phone I download on LibGen and then I have like twelve tabs open at any given time. And um, that I'm also fucking doing polemics with people on the internet, which is actually probably the biggest waste of my time. I should just stop doing that and just read more because I, I never regret it. Yeah, we really should because this is way this is way more important because now we get into the whole research project that that we're actually doing here. Because I don't know after the, after the last show and we did it about the JFK assassination, but uh, you know we've we've just kept talking we're just talking to uh, Edberg every day. And we're just getting really into kind of like uh, industrial organization, like industrial management, like anarchism in the you know late 19th century, you know, the history of the AFL-CIO, like all this stuff. Like it's so fucking, there's so much there. People have no idea about any of this and about how it all ties together and the way that it affects modern history. I don't know. So me, me, me you know, now, now it's, we're going to do this with Logo. And we're we're going to sort of tackle this first topic, which is going to be, we're going to go back to like kind of the Francis Bacon era to Elizabeth I. We're going to talk a bit about the emergence of kind of a British imperial project out of that. And then we're going to go, uh, in this show, we're going to you know, do kind of an overview of a bunch of different things. We're going to start there. We're going to talk about the development of, uh, you know, finance in the British you know, empire where the idea of the British Empire comes from. We're going to talk about Robinson Crusoe and some of the economic ideas of of those you know seventeenth to eighteenth century. And then also, you know, I'm really in a cybernetics like mood now because we were just you know yelling about cybernetics on on Twitter. So uh, you know, one of the things I really want to also concentrate on though is you know social Darwinism and you know Victorian cybernetics. I guess you could call it because there's actually a lot. There that I didn't know. That's what we've been reading about. We've been reading, uh, I guess I'll post the books, some of the ones that we use, but I think we both read this one. Um, yeah. Political Descent. That was a good one. That was, re- yeah, that, that was a really good one. That's one of the ones I would most recommend uh, people read to learn a bit more about this. This is one of the better ones. And then there's been a ton more about more specific things, but Political Descent, let me see what the. The title is uh, exactly "Political Descent: Malthus Mutualism and the Politics of, of Evolution in Victorian England." It's by Piers J. Hale. It's really good. Uh, yeah, but we're gonna kind of give an overview of those topics, and then I'm gonna do another show. Uh, the next one is gonna be more about um, kind of like scientific management, and you know, around 1900. And then uh, I'm going to do one with Edberg, Ed, Edberg too. Following that, which is going to be about um, you know finance around 1900, and we're going to be kind of focusing on that uh, era of like the 1870s to like the 1920s, because actually nobody knows anything about this at all, like at all. Like I was even looking for info on the first Red Scare, and which. Uh, the last book really about it that I could find was from 1955, the last general history of the first Red Scare and like all the anarchist terrorism that happened in like 1919 and 1920. Yeah. I don't even know how, well, who's, why are people not, fo- I mean, we like, nobody it, cares that's the problem this. with America in general is like we, we have no connection to these histories. They like don't exist. Uh, the whole 19th century in America is, is just taken up so much by like the civil war 
and um, everything's read through this conflict in a very like isolated manner. Um, and there's like no real contact with geopolitics. Like you kind of mentioned Napoleon or something a little bit in the general overview of history. Yeah, and like uh, sailors, sailors getting pressed into service during the War of eighteen twelve. Kind of that. That's like the main thing. Yeah, but there's no talk about even like the the origins of the financial system or the the problems with the bank. Like the way that the Jacksonian bank struggle is set up is like pretty nonsensical. Especially like because it takes it doesn't take into account um, various like foreign interests in America at the time. Yeah, you know, I just some of this stuff is crazy. I mean, we were talking on the JFK one uh, first about like how Sullivan and Cromwell were the Dulles brothers were partners, how they were the ones who, uh, you know, William Cromwell he came up with this corporate structure that allowed corporations to own shares in other corporations, and he basically invented the shell corporation or you know the holding company, and that's he's the one who basically put that into U.S. law around the country and defend it. He sent the Sullivan and Cromwell lawyers everywhere to defend it in different states from challenges, and it was a way to circumvent the antitrust laws. So, no, that's never talked about ever because then you know I'm reading separate books about financial history during that era, and they don't mention they talk about some of the same events like the founding of U.S. Steel and stuff, but they actually don't mention Sullivan and Cromwell at all. Yeah. And yeah, it's like, and then the whole thing with the Panama yep. uh, Canal, and the, like that's not even mentioned on Wikipedia at all. It's like, so we gotta like, I gotta just get into more, more of the the facts and more of the, you know, uh, different way of kind of looking at history. It gets worse the more the further back you go. You know, if we're gonna take this as a segue into the Elizabethan era and just a little bit prior, because the whole thing is so much more of a mess than. The general, the general story is right because uh, what do we do? What do we do? We have a uh, Henry the Eighth, and you know he just wants a divorce, and so here we go. That's the story, right? I mean, that's like one of the main things you can you can start at with because uh, I was reading in this one of the uh, books that I, I have about Francis Bacon that really the generation you know of Francis Bacon's father, who was also a you know a servant of the crown. Is that they were were coming out of the of Henry the Eighth's regime, and these were like some of the people who survived, right? Because you had famously like the competition between uh, Thomas More and Thomas Cromwell during that period, where you know they they uh, you know Thomas Cromwell he got Thomas More killed, pretty much, right? That's the story. Yeah, and that's because and uh what's even more interesting right is that Thomas More is like he's like an Erasmus kind of renaissance humanist so he's not even like necessarily um in the the good standings of the Catholic Church but then and so he like writes all these um things against Luther in on behalf of Henry the 8th and Tinsdale was another one the guy Tinsdale was yeah Tinsdale's really hated Tinsdale's like connected to more of like the bohemian like who sites and stuff like they're and that was a whole issue of like translation and like he was he was translating the the bible and that's what they didn't like him for if i remember yeah well specifically for translating a few specific phrases in a a way that they would not have wanted um yeah, which basically would have support would have supported more their like unit proto unitarian conceptions, um, because like they you know that like the Protestant Reformation, the Reformation in general, we also just take as like you know this kind of like singular or the idea that it's like Protestants and Catholics as opposed to like you know there's all these strange um, alliances made across the lines, and then all the Protestants hate each other and they're like burning each other at the stake too. So because of dissent, because of the English dissent. Because that's another thing that especially that uh, like Daniel Defoe was wrapped up in. And I don't think people, and that's like the, the issue with uh, Thomas Cromwell and all that, is there's a whole history there about dissent from the church, the Church of England, that's really important that isn't, you know, most people don't really understand the, the complexities of that. Yeah. Yeah. So if we start with like Henry the Eighth, um, the real figure I'm really looking at is, uh, William Cecil, the Baron of Burghley's father, Richard Cecil. He's, he's the real one who, um, he rises in favor under Henry the Eighth and he becomes the high sheriff of Northamptonshire. And, um, 
From there, he keeps moving on up. His son then is William Cecil, who's probably the most powerful man in the Elizabethan era. He's essentially the real power behind the throne. He's in charge. He holds the the he's like the lead of the Privy Council. He's essentially the Secretary of State, and then he also get acquires um, control over the wardship, which is all of the um, young the nobles who who are fatherless or lose their their. Uh, their parents while they're young. Yeah, wards, not not words, W-A-R-D-S. Yeah, wards, wards of the state, wards of the crown. Like, you know, I think I think that's in like Batman, right? And like Robin is the Batman wards. People should know about that, yeah. And it's a lot like that because he's also building up the uh, an intelligence circle because he's trying to weather the storm through the succession between Mary and Elizabeth. And it's a very fraught time Um no one knows which way it's going to go. So he's trying to place his bets on both sides, kind of, but without getting, um, you know, fucked. So he's got to have intelligence on in, you know, in every single place and like see which way the wind's blowing. Um, for that matter, he then becomes the leader of the um, Order of the Garter, I believe it's called. Yeah, the Garter, which is like the. Um, <laughs> Which is like the CIA, basically. It's basically like the Elizabethan CIA. And, you know, he's tied up with uh, Francis Walsingham, who's like the, the spy master. And, you know, they, uh, they set up everyone. Because then also it, it says that Bacon also was trying to set up an uh, intelligence network for, uh, what, Essex? Was, is that who it is? Yeah, there's and there's a conflicted loyalty there with with Bacon and then his his loyalty to Elizabeth the first and that is an, an issue that's under you know contention that sort of I guess Cecil's pushing. Yes, because the the there's an internal struggle over what like who if there's going to be a Protestant alliance of states or if um, England can kind of make its peace with Spain who is like their primary antagonist at the time with like the Spanish Armada and whatnot claims over the new world. And what's more important is uh, control in the Mediterranean and trade with the Sultan in um, God, what's it called at the time? The, the like Ottomans, basically the proto Ottomans, the Sultanate um, who control like Greece and access to the Silk Road and that sort of thing. So like there's these, co- these trading companies um, which are the prototypes for like the East Indies company called like the, uh, the Libya company and various other things like that. And, uh, they, they're the ones who have, uh, you know, a monopoly on trade with the East. And everybody, like, that's a big thing that also people, I think, don't, don't necessarily uh, realize off the top of their head is that everything is monopoly based and charter charter based in in you know English history in these these earlier times so it, like everything like all the companies all the like uh uh the theaters in London like the publishers is that it was all very highly regulated is that you needed charters from the crown to set these things up and the the, the crown very often uh established monopolies for for different trades yeah, mostly monopolies. It was very rare for it not to be a monopoly. And like, you know, that's also, you have one of those monopolies, it's sort of like being knighted in a way also. Yeah, and so this is like one of the, you know, with all the colonies that, that get set up is that they're they're obviously, they're all uh, chartered. And if, and like John D is given a big, uh, a big charter to develop a lot of land in uh, America too. And that's like, there's that this whole history there uh, we have to get into of the, uh, you know, the development of America as an idea and like how the British Empire, like as a concept, comes out of that. Yeah, it, the, another thing John D does right is uh, that's where the Muscovy Company comes into the kind of Anglo-Russian um, relations start becoming big, a bigger deal at the time um, because you know they're, they Russia and England both have um, you know a, a concerted interest in not having a united like continental power which would make it more difficult for them, especially to have access to the Mediterranean if it's like all allied together uh, against them. You know, like if you think of like an independent England, like British Isles, and then you have like uh, any of these sorts of the the Roman Catholic Church or if it's um, like the Holy Roman Empire or like Habsburg Spain, same sort of thing. They, they have control over like the entire Mediterranean. 
which is still the center of the world at, at the time. And then like this is like the time when like the center of the world is kind of shifting because of the discovery of the new world and like the the uh, the West Indies, right? And all the new products coming out of that. And so this is literally this is you know it's crazy just because during this time, uh, you know, I guess this is 1590, is that you have. Uh, Francis Bacon was organizing on on Essex, Essex's behalf an intelligence network that the command of such a network was deemed a prime political asset as illustrated by the fact that young Robert Cecil, as ambitious as Essex as a privy, of a privy councillor's place, was now building an intelligence service of his own. And, it's, you know, there's apparently like there's a whole shadow war that happens. Yeah. And uh, this this is like... If you're an Oxfordian and you're woke on the authorship question, like me and uh, like uh, <laughs> Alexander Waugh and Falstaff and all the smart people um, and uh, Walt Whitman and Nabokov and <laughs> millions of people throughout time, um, you know, it's it's very much tied to this because the Essex Rebellion, right, um, which is very much like not covered and is mostly only. Uh, has only been discovered due to um, other courtiers and like other countries having covered it uh, for their own sovereigns. Wasn't really that well known in um, England at the time. It was kind of covered up. Was there was there was potent like the whole problem of Elizabeth having no specific heir was what was going to happen next because the Elizabethan era is a kind of stop. It's a stop to it's a freezing over of all these conflicts that are bubbling beneath the surface over what the future of England is going to be, which way it's going to go. And Essex, they were looking to put in someone else that, other than King James as the successor. And there's so there's this huge rivalry between Essex and, and Robert Cecil, and Francis Bacon is the, like, he sees Essex as his patron, basically, but this becomes a huge issue uh, because Cecil uses this against Bacon and puts a wedge in there. So a question is like whether or not like because they paint Essex then as being like disloyal. So Bacon is put in a position of having to choose his loyalties basically. Not only that, but Cecil's Cecil's playing behind the scenes, and he gets Essex to uh, lead a, to attempt to lead the like uh, suppression of Ireland, essentially like taming of the Irish frontier. And it's a it's a it goes horribly for him. It does not go well. And because of that sort of failure, it definitely uh, downplays his ability to uh, control the succession. Like uh, Cecil is like the worm tongue in Elizabeth's ear throughout the whole period. Yeah, and so obviously Great Britain doesn't exist at this point. This is something that, you know, one of the things I just thinking back on always really pissed me off is I saw, what's that girl's name? Uh, Lori Penny, and she's debating some like historian or something, and she's like doesn't even know that... Great Britain like didn't always exist. Yeah, and it's like it's so crazy. It's like I don't even know if that really even needs to be said. But you know, uh, basically before the Acts of Union of seventeen oh seven, there's uh, you know separate crowns over England and Scotland, right? And they actually you know even though the same person might sit on the two thrones, they're separate political entities, separate thrones. And you know Ireland, so you there's no Great Britain, there's no United Kingdom or United Great Britain at this point, and really, there's a whole history that now is going to unravel from this point that involves not only creating Great Britain but also uh, you know colonizing America and then also developing the British Empire and also creating the balance of power system in Europe. And so it's like the the whole England is not some little country that you know Winston Churchill and their little noble island or whatever. It's like the, since this time has been like this huge fucking uh, you know this is like there. I always think that the Anglo's like they're the they're the real Jews. <laughs> like it's it's crazy. I mean that's not even that's not even an overstatement though because. A lot of what is described, like uh, the way that the like specific anti Semites will go about this, is that they'll just say like, you know, all the Anglo's are like crypto Jews, and they, that like, you know, they let in Jews to their court and things like that, um, as if like the Spanish weren't doing that or like everyone wasn't doing that, and uh, they tie this to the changing like financial policies because usury was kind of on off legal for a lot of this time and. Um, and Cecil supports usury. Yeah, he supports it because he's like, this is making us a fuck ton of money. Like, why? What do we? Why wouldn't we do this? It makes no sense. Like, if we're trying to like have power 
um, economic power, especially like uh, in the state, like this is going to, you know, give us a lot of money to play with. So, and this goes back, back to 1558 and Francis Bacon's father. All right. And he, right. He's put into, it's him and William Cecil and he's put into place. They're, they're, they're given a job to, uh, do an audit of all of the, all of the finances is, and so this, this is like an important, uh, kind of juncture juncture here because then they you know now understand i guess before then it was very mysterious about like what the crown actually owned and like what the like who the crown owned uh, owed money to and like who owned what but this like uh you know was a major multi-year kind of project to actually document this stuff so like this is the you know there's a whole new kind of accounting that comes up during this time uh and you know it's it's not only just about uh, you know, economic accounting, but really all this stuff kind of that we were starting to talk about, of like these intelligence networks and this accounting and stuff, it's all connected into like what Francis Bacon ends up talking about in his conception of like knowledge is power. And, and that, you know, it's a, it's, it's a whole political project that involves, uh, you know, all these different kinds of measurement and, and account, accounting and precision and, you know, knowledge in that sense, that's, you know, going to be the basis of the, the British empire. Yeah. And it's also the specific like territory holdings, because this is when, you know, this is a small country that doesn't even control Ireland and Scotland yet. So it's all about expanding on that. And, but then it's also about expanding into like the new world. Yeah. And so that's like one of the, you know, this is goes into, we've talked about this before, We've never really gone that in depth into it, but you know, this is, you know, we can talk about John Dee and the Rosicrucians here because this is like, you know, a really important concept, uh, that has a lot of consequences for all of European history going forward, uh, is the, the development of like the balance of power system and the idea of basically a English run kind of coalition of Protestant nations that are going to, uh, kind of keep the continent in check and make sure that nobody becomes too powerful so that they could like oppose England. Basically. But this is, this is where it all begins is in Elizabeth's time is that this is kind of like the project that these guys are kind of dreaming up in different versions of it, right? Yeah, but they're dreaming it up in different ways. They're, they have different. Yeah, they're, they each have their own vision. Yeah. Goals. They've got different visions for what England's role would be and what. Uh, specific like philosophy essentially they'd be trying to max to like maximize or export or produce and i mean you said that so basically cecil wins in the end yeah and the, so i mean so like this is uh, you know uh, is is that mean finance then is like that is, is that his vision for england basically pretty much it's pretty his his goal is just um like they describe it as a economic nationalism here but it's mostly just like imperialism yeah, I don't know the, the the nationalism stuff. Nationalism is a very misused word. Yeah, it's like anachronistically applied there, but it because it's specifically for the empire. But he's just looking to like absolutely maximize um, the power of England. But this is like the whole problem of like centralization and basically drawing together because this is obviously the whole idea of feudalism is that if you're like a baron or they don't, I guess they don't have barons in England. They have earls is their version. So if you're like an earl or whatever in, in, in England, you, uh, control, like you own like your village or whatever. Right. And it's all based around these little, these medieval, you know, village structures and the, the, the serfs that live there that do the farming and they pay the rent to the Lords. And then like the Lord owns that, like literally, in like the sovereign sense is that this is like his territory, not even in the sense of like, you know, he's a plantation owner in, you know, the South or whatever, and he owns the land. Like this is more in the sense of like, his, this is his sovereign territory. And so that's like the system under feudalism is then, you know, if you're the, the person at the top is not, you know, doesn't have all this territorial power because they give off they give out all the territory to their supporters as basically payment and they they get rent back and they you know that's the that's the concept of it so basically what's happening during this time and England is one of the like the the pioneers here but then also the French too under under Richelieu and, and Louis the the 14th when they're in the you know 30 years war era is that they're the ones who kind of are developing this new system which you could call you know nationalism 
you know, in a vague sense. But they, that's where, you know, they're wiping away feudalism, they're consolidating, you know, the centralized control of the crown. Yeah, and specifically under the crown and not the church. So this is so that's like the big deal is that it's there won't these uh, sorts of conflicts between the barons and whatnot the earls won't be going to the church but to the state. And I mean, and this is like one of the 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 things about why they're setting up a church in the first place, is the why they need a Church of England. I mean, the Church of England is such a weird institution because it kind of is. Yeah, well, who's the head of the Church of England? Right, it's the queen. Yeah. But and then it's it's obviously so neutered too, like religiously. It's literally just the compromise position because you have it. It's to it's it exists to basically recreate a lot of what exists in Catholicism, but not too much of it because you also have to like please the more like iconoclastic Protestants, and so it's just this institution that exists solely to compromise between these sorts of sects that existed at the time and mostly just to prop them up underneath like supporting the state. Uh, yeah, this is the whole, the history of dissent that runs through, uh, you know, English history. It gets resolved like into the, the 18th century basically, but during the kind of, from the establishment of the church until, you know, the, you know, into the 18th century, this is a dominating issue that's also, you know, tying into who's, people going to America and why they're going to obviously the, the, the pilgrims, but also there's like this huge, crazy, uh, you know, network of, of different sects that are like devolving constantly. And that, you know, the, 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 the civil war happens. Uh, so that's like, you know, they obviously they established this church in order, you know, to, to kind of like oppose feudalism. And this is what they do in, uh, in a lot of German countries too with the Lutheran churches that they set up. It's like in Prussia, that was a big deal. Um, so they're actually opposing like Catholic, you know, control of the continent at this point because it's the Holy Roman Empire ostensibly in charge. But really it's like there's a dynastic system of control. Like pe you, I always get into this debate on Twitter with people uh, or, or they don't understand that a nation doesn't just exist because people live a in a place, you know? Yeah. Is that it really, there's a whole way of the, of structuring these entities that during the, like the 17th century, it wasn't based around a nation. It was based around a territorial dynasty. And you had Spain, for example, who has a Habsburg monarch. And the Habsburgs also are in charge of Austria. And then the Austrian king is, you know, uh, by convention, also elected to be the Holy Roman Emperor. And then the Holy Roman Empire controls not just Germany, but Germany, the German territories in that era would have included like Poland and Czechoslovakia. And like, it's a huge area of territories that's like way bigger than what Germany is now. And so... That's what the Habsburgs control. And then also through Spain, the Habsburgs also control the Netherlands too. And on the same time, you also have the competing, like the Bourbons are the, like their major competitors who are in charge of France. But the, the point isn't that like, you know, they're not nations, is that this is kind of like structured more even in a business sense, is that these people are above the nations that they rule. Like you, you, you have these monarchs that are just going into territories that don't even speak the language there or anything. We're becoming the king uh, by marriage or something overnight. It's, there's no territorial conquest required. Even there are times where like huge, uh, you know, changes of territorial possession happen really quickly based on inheritance or, or succession, and you know it, it's very destabilizing. First of all, but it is also. You know, this is more like the du the Dupont family or the Rockefeller family, really. Not not uh, you know national political government. It's you know a corporation basically that's uh, developing not only nations in Europe but also all these colonial territories that they're starting to get into at this time. Yeah, it's much more like that than not. And you could say, like, in vice versa, that you know the Duponts are much more like medieval monarchs than you know not. Yeah, yeah, this is a you know really important way to kind of conceive of it, because you can also see like why uh, you know their economic policies are leading them to 
also, you know, consider uh, imperialism and they want to develop that and why everything is done under these royal charters. And, you know, really it's like these are all just like little subsidiary companies basically. And, that you know, it's all flowing back into this single family and the family has different branches, you know, uh, it, it's all very it's structured in a completely different way. So basically, you know, I was reading about this a while ago, but you have John Dee's like the one who basically lays out the vision of the, the British Empire in his work on navigation, right? Yeah, very explicitly. He is the first one to even use the term uh, the British Empire. And this is like the, the, the idea of the, the, the name being Britain and things is tied to this sort of more um, mythological heritage of the, the Britons being the descendants of uh, Brutus, in some sense, the Roman, but in another sense, like the Trojan. He was, he wrote a lot of myths. I was looking into all this mythological kind of stuff that he was doing. And it's very, it's incredibly elaborate, like the works that he's actually, the, the lengths that he's going to. Yeah. I mean, my favorite is, uh, like, like King Arthur weighs so heavily on the minds of these people also. And it's kind of like the origin of the Republican form or the notion of like the elective monarch and stuff is like very important. Um, and he, he basically says that, you know, King Arthur, uh, was Welsh and he conquered uh, the British Isles and also into America. So that would, so he was saying that to counter, to uh, dispute the claims of the, the Catholics, the uh, Pope who said that it was Spanish territory. It's unbelievable because he actually is like kind of serious, really. And there's this whole thing that goes on with like, uh, there's papal agents who are like active at the same time. Like they're, like, this is crazy history because is it, you know, this is like true history and it's not really like, you know, that far out, but there's, you know, papal agents working in England at this time too. And John D is like claiming that basically they went and destroyed the documents that like proved that King Arthur went and conquered America. Yeah. And, it's like, and he he makes this in like a very plain faced. Kind of, it's not like he's writing a literary like ironic thing. He's like laying out a lot of, you know, principles of like navigation of like the idea of, uh, you know, we're going to go to America and stuff. And he's like telling the history about England's claims to America. And this is one that he totally makes on like just he he treats it as a real historical claim and uh, tries to marshal like actual evidence for it. Yeah, he's not joking around or being ironic, which is, it's hard, like, especially because a lot of these terms have become such a part of the, like, conspiracy theory mythos in the more fantastical or romantic sense, you know, talking about, like, the Jesuits and the Freemasons and the Rosicrucians and these things, that people have, like, trouble taking it seriously as historical material fact. But these sorts of networks have always been around in history, these sorts of like secret societies, these sorts of conspiracies, the control of information, the destruction of documents, the production of forgeries. These sorts of things have always been around and it makes the historical record much more complicated when you like realize that. He's saying stuff like he's saying that basically the part, like one of the claims is first of all that uh, he goes to America, the King Arthur basically, not only does he conquer America, but he also conquers the North Pole. And that he, he, he's saying that they had a big fleet of ships, right? And that they conquered the North Pole and that some of them, you know, they went to Greenland and Iceland. And that, you know, they also went to America and they, they, they laid claim there. And then there's also another thread that basically there is a Welsh and John Dee is Welsh, right? I think that's why he's yeah. making everyone Welsh. But he's also saying that basically there was a Welsh prince who went to America also. And that uh, that's another separate claim that England has over America is that the Welsh basically, uh, uh, you know, developed the first colony there or, or, or something. And that this is actually a legend that then persists for a really long time because then when uh, William and Clark, or uh, William Clark and uh, what is their voyage, you know, Thomas Jefferson and the Louisiana Purchase and Lewis and Clark, yeah, uh, they... They uh, go over there into, uh, like Thomas Jefferson tells them when they're going into the Louisiana Territory that they need to look out for the Welsh Indians. And he's like totally serious. He's like, you know, can you find the Welsh Indians? Like find out what secrets they have? Yeah, no, this is this is something everyone believes in at the time. And it's something we also don't really think about, you know, this sort of, this sort of mythos um, and its potential realities in a certain extent. Because if you look like there's a lot of archaeological evidence now for 
um, tin mining and things in the Great Lakes region and f- it, during like the time of the Bronze Age. Um, and, you know, some, I, I believe some uh, like tin and whatnot has actually been found to have originated there and made its way over into the European continent. And this was, you know, you can go back to like the Phoenicians who gave the name to Britain for their name for like the tin island, essentially, because like Ireland comes from like their name for the like iron. And then there's Britain, which has lots of tin. And um, <laughs> they they start off right on like the uh, southern half of the Mediterranean and then they move up over to Spain and then from there, obviously, it's like a hop, skip, and a jump over to the British Isles. And then, you know, the question is, like, how much further did they go? Or, like, did the, the like, what, we don't really have much of an understanding of where all this sort of stuff came from or how old that stuff really is. If you look at, like, what the ancient geographers actually, like, who they are, like, what works they leave behind, it's like the record is very, like, sparse basically about like ancient geography and what their territorial knowledge was and their maps and stuff is that there's actually not a lot there. Uh, so really nobody fucking knows. I mean, it was, it was like secrets to be kept, right? Like that was like very high level information to have is if you know where all of these places are, like you wouldn't necessarily want <laughs> everyone to know. Yeah, for the Phoenicians, yeah, especially because they're traders, and then you know that's what Car- the, the Carthaginian em- uh, you know empires they're they're Phoenicians. Yeah, and so the Phoenicians are like obviously this hugely powerful, uh, you know, they're like a race of people that they're not territorial uh, in a nation uh, state kind of way. And that's nobody understands that you can't just call everything a nation just because there's people who live a place. But that you know, Phoenicians are you know uh, moving all over the Mediterranean. And they have all different types of colonies. And you go back to the ancient times, it's like uh, you have the the Greeks who are going into Europe and who are like colonizing Italy during this time. It's like, so even in that pe- period, it's like there was a whole race for a new world, which was like in Europe at that time. And really, you know, all of these, you know, it's, it's, a, not, ne- it's not the case that we're just in history, these, these different peoples are just discovering a place that just exists. It's like you're also, when they're doing that building up, they're constructing the idea of these places. They're building the idea of the world and what it consists in and what these places are and how it fits together. And that has this whole heritage that goes back all the way like to the Phoenicians. And also, you know, it extends into when we're going into America too because, you know, uh, John D. he's not just talking about, okay, there's this land over there, we're going to go scientifically explore it. You know, it has a lot of like importance, uh, you know, symbolically and like mythologically to what, what what's going on in, in England at the time. It's like, inf- it really, it continues to this day in influencing how we conceptualize like the entire world. Yeah, it really does. Um, I mean, it's, it's just wild. I start getting into like a kind of new chronology, like Fomenko type mood uh, when I think about this, because, you know, if we're also talking about the Phoenicians, right? Like the Romans, like fuck them up and destroy all of their stuff. So there's not really that much documentation either of what they were doing at the time or like, you know, their own texts and things. A lot of these things are just like gone. So you're looking at this sort of void and you've got the histories that are left from the people who won essentially. And, you know, how much of that is just propaganda, obviously a good amount of it. Right. And so the question is like, what is the real game going on here? Because it still seems to be a sort of similar, if you like a lot of people, especially the more continental, like European idealists would consider, you know, Britain to be like the new Carthage. Yeah, and the, the, you know that's a whole other thing that they do and how they conceptualize themselves, because you can call them the you know Carthaginians like that's way more appropriate. But they're considering themselves uh, the Augustans. That's really why if you don't know the 18th century is referred to as the Augustan era. Sometimes like retards call it the Georgian era because of King George first, second, third. Yeah, but really it's the Augustan era. And if you know anything about, it, you'll call it the Augustan era. Uh, but that's the reason that it's called that is because of, you know, their, their Dryden is translating Virgil. 
Uh, and you know that's how all the, the, they conceptualize themselves in that terms, and so it's like the the they're putting a gloss on their own history as they're making it, right? And you know they can be considered in a completely different sense, uh, and and that they're actually basically taking over the world in this way that's not necessarily, uh, you know, they're involved in a deep power struggle where they're fighting the Catholic Church, they're fighting the Habsburgs, they're fighting the Bourbons. And they have a particular vision for the world that involves this balance of power idea. And this gets into like this political theory of, uh, you know, someone like Montesquieu, right? There's a lot underpinning this. Because at the time, during going back into these eras, there's no such uh, discipline known as economics. That doesn't exist yet. And it's actually called political arithmetic is the first like original term for, uh, you know, what economics eventually becomes. It then is called political economy, and then it's just called economics. Uh, but there's a whole theory underpinning all of this that has to do with the difference between um, trading republics and also territorial monarchies. And you can look at basically, um, there's like the, the Netherlands at the same time, which as I said, is like uh, uh, controlled by Spain. And they're like in a similar position as Great Britain. And these, the, there's uh, not only this is why they have a kind of alliance that they try to set up too, but they're also like prime competitors in all of this too. Because during this whole 17th century era, this is what Britain is working towards is they want to basically become a trading republic. And the idea of the, the, the monarch is actually, uh, you know, is problematic. You know, people look at the 18th century or something, and they they see there's the king, King George the Third, and when we're uh, America's revolting against the crown, really that there, it's a republic. England's a republic at that point. So during the 17th century era, is that they're really heading towards this whole process of becoming a small island republican mercantile nation that's running this huge empire through all these charter companies, basically. Yeah, and uh, this sort of divide is still used um, in geopolitics. Like, you know, there's the thalassocracies, which are the uh, sea-based uh, trading republics, and then there's the teleocracy, which is the land-based, um, usually closer to um, monarchy or feudalism. So it's, it's an interesting divide because... Um, a lot of it's it's it leads to a couple a couple of different things because you have um, the general Republican impulse behind the like thalassocracy and the 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 sea based hegemony. Um, you get lots of metaphors about uh, the ship of state and these sorts of things. Um, as opposed and uh, oh, that's true. Yeah, title titles and you know ownership is more liquid in a, a symbolic sense. Also, there's a lot less about being like the the landed uh, hegemony, and it's a lot more about um, uh, things being able to move around as opposed to being like a permanent order. Yeah, and this actually really is really uh, significant in economic the history of economic theory. This is a, one of the major central things is because during like the 17th century is that this is the economic model that they begin developing is these, these questions start to develop over, uh, you know, how luxury comes about and what luxury is and um, like how uh, industry works. And it ties into this whole idea about land development, right? Yeah. And that's, that's the whole point of it is that, uh, you know, and we're going to go into Malthus in a little bit, but this ties into all this stuff with land development. It goes all the way back to like this kind of early economic theory is that basically once you have a, a, the land developed enough where it can produce food so that not everybody has to farm, then those people are going to be forced to uh, engage in a manufacturing kind of uh, job of some kind and produce wares. Or, and those wares, that's luxury, right? And that that's what the basis of commerce is, is you have an industry that's producing these luxuries that you can then export. And so that's what a country like England is trying to go for, is that that's the, the commercial economy that they're trying to develop. And so you have someone like Montesquieu when he's writing and he's, he's making, that's like this is his main distinction that he's making. And, uh, you know, based in France, 
he's stressing that it's a large territorial economy and that, you know, it's tied to the land and that people try to use this all throughout the 18th century. This is actually what ends up causing the French Revolution is that there's these guys called the physiocrats uh, who are the economic liberal reformers in France before the revolution. That's something else that, uh, you know, the people don't, people don't get about the French Revolution is that it actually happened because of liberalism is that that's what causes a lot of the land problems, the, the food problems in France, is that they're trying to use this theory to basically uh, do agricultural reform because they're trying to realize that f- the basis of France is agriculture and land and, you know, uh, volume of land. And so they're trying to develop the land for agricultural purposes as an alternative to these uh, trading republics. And it fails, and then you know everyone gets hungry, and then there's a revolution. So this is like a very significant, like this is one of the driving ideas behind economics, like through Darwin and stuff. Yeah, the real divide in the republics, right, is whether or not the emphasis should be on speculation and sort of um, making money off of uh, the trade itself, like the exchange, or if the goal should be towards the maximum development of industry via like arts and sciences, et cetera. Oh, and oh, that's actually really interesting. I don't know. You haven't uh, told me about how you can talk about this, but how Bacon kind of fits in between like, where does, what direction does he end up going between Essex and Cecil? Because this is Bacon's whole like project is his like new Atlantis and stuff is that he's also, he's following D here in his uh, concept of a, of a, you know, empire, Right, and he, he's basing it all on knowledge, and uh, he, it's a huge reform project because, in this sense, like we're looking at all this stuff with like technocrats and like uh, scientific management of the state and everything. And uh, you know, Bacon is definitely a forerunner there because you know he is exactly that. He's a politician, and he's a you know he works in the law and he works in legal theory, uh, and he's engaging in this kind of like statecraft and like legal design. And he has a clear conception about basically uh, elite scientific management. And that's what New Atlantis is about. In a way, though, it's also tied to the like Thomas More's utopia, though, um, that whole genre. Yeah, you said that you were reading, you know, go tell, talk about that because I was interested in what you were finding out when you were reading that the other day. Yeah, so Thomas More's utopia is, is like, in a way, it's also kind of Republican in its ideals, but it's um, supposed to represent like a universal republic as opposed to like a particular republic. Um, And so that's kind of why he's like, he's like a Renaissance humanist. So he is still believes that like the church could represent this sort of universalist republic. And Bacon's switch is more towards like the kind of secretive republic, right? Where the new Atlantis has to be essentially like hidden from the maps Right. And like no one knows that it exists, but it's this extremely powerful, like secret research organization. It's kind of like the ideal of like the Rosicrucians, right? Would be that there is this like secret counterforce um, existing that represents a kind of utopia um, that is just like purely devoted to this. And this is what li- literally, like, it's literally about this. Yeah. Renaissance humanism in a way, though, like the development of like the sciences and the arts and that like this sort of thing is. Um, is uh has to stay out of the way of like terrestrial powers because it's threatened by those sorts of things. That's sort of what Bacon thinks. It kind of is also a reflection of his own position, though, within um the Elizabethan hierarchy, especially as it goes over towards like the succession of James, because it doesn't go well for him at all. He gets uh eventually committed to the Tower of London. Um and it's he's stripped of all of his titles and it's not good for him. It, it doesn't go well. They're, he, they're kind of, he's kind of sniffed out as kind of having this sort of like, you know, especially for his, uh, alliance with Essex, um, these sorts of Renaissance ideals, um, as opposed to the, what is now becoming the, uh, British Empire, whose goals are mostly on, uh, making the most on exchange value and, you know, just, uh, accumulating wealth through like piracy, basically. Oh yeah, that's actually really interesting. I mean, that makes a lot of sense because a bit what Bacon is talking about is uh, you know, totally opposed to this kind of like financial speculation. Yeah, and I mean the way that he's you know his vision of it is that on New Atlantis there's a thing called Solomon's House, 
And I was saying that, like, I was telling, I think I told you, like, this is, you know, the way that it's set up is basically like the first think tank. This is like the Baconian, like, Rand Corporation. Uh, it, it's actually uncanny. But, you know, he's he's talking about, like, um, you know, that there's this uh, House of Solomon, Solomon's house, and it's dedicated to the study of the works and creatures of God. The foundation had two purposes and uh, science and the enlarging of human empire. The effect would be to bring the affecting of all things possible within the grasp of the brethren of Solomon's house. The noblest foundation that ever was upon the earth was not secluded from the world. It was the uh, the lantern of the kingdom. Although they were called brethren, these men were not to be confused with monks who disavowed the world. On the contrary, Bacon made a point of describing the magnificent robes and bearing that they were great noblemen and an elite class of state practitioners. At the disposal of the brethren are a vast complex of rooms, houses, caves, ponds, gardens, parks, brew houses, furnaces, dispensaries, and the like for their discoveries into the knowledge of causes and the secret motions of things. Yet these are, uh, so basically he's, he's describing like a whole complex in this this Solomon's house on New Atlantis is that he's envisioning it as like this huge scientific research uh, complex that has all these artificial laboratories and environments in it. Then they're using it to basically make an encyclopedia of, you know, not only science, but this is also including industrial sciences as well of, you know, how to make things and how to do things. And so the, the, I can definitely see like this is the, the, the way that he's conceiving of it, of it is like, you know, you're, you're making like a high tech. It's, it's Wakanda. Kind of like industry within. You, yeah, it's like yeah, like yeah. this sort of idea still exists. Um, that's like even in the whole like Black Panther movie, right? Is that like Wakanda is like hidden from the world, right? And that's it has like these uh it has like these rare minerals or whatever that um like rare earth minerals, right? <laughs> that uh it has to like keep hid- hidden so that it can like maintain its um pure devotion to um you know producing high technology. And uh, you know the, the innovations, industrial innovations, and these sorts of things. It's funny, yeah. It's funny that you should even say that though, because like you, it, you just, people just throw up Wakanda, and it's like a huge joke. But really, uh, there's actually this whole history that no one talks about in relation to this. I think I was the only person I ever saw who made this point. But Ethiopia has like a he- very long history in literature of basically being that already. Yeah, Prester John's kingdom. Yeah, and no, then this is like uh, there's a book called Samuel. It's by Samuel, Doctor Samuel Johnson from 1759, the history of Ra- Razzles, and that's what it's about. It's about like this kingdom uh, that's supposed to be Ethiopia. It's called uh, a- Abyssinia, I think is the way he calls it. But it's in Africa. It's a hidden country in Africa that's totally closed off from the world, and they have advanced scientific knowledge. And it's about the Prince Razales and how he wants to leave the kingdom to go learn about the world. And so this even goes back to like Greek times, is that, you know, just as an aside, is that there's this whole history about Ethiopia that's basically Wakanda. And it's, you know, yeah. Stan Lee didn't come up with that. I mean, it's like a very old kind of trope in literature. Yeah, he didn't come up with Thor either, but, you know. <laughs> but I, I just find it like the the interesting part to me is that it's, um, it's a, a, there's like different conceptions of what the sort of like, th- like that, like the uh, sea-based republic or this sort of universal empire, these sorts of things have different um, symbolic connotations. And they're kind of like generally mixed up by people as if um, they're all the same. I, I like when people call Bacon like a proto-globalist or whatever, which a lot of like the continental types, uh, type thinkers will do, who are generally, you know, uh, standing the, uh, like a return to the Habsburg monarchies or something. <laughs> No, what what uh, what do you think the differences are between like Cecil and Bacon in that point? Because also, uh, you were telling me about the the first uh, exchange that opens up in London and how that's charted by Elizabeth, and you know how the, that's Cecil behind that. Yeah, that's Cecil, um, and that's also like you know the relations with the Dutch at the time. They like they were just copying the uh, like basically the first stock exchange that had opened up in. Uh, in um god the netherlands right and this sort of um like the the joint stock corporation um along with uh like the stock market uh really starts at this time and 
Um, that sort of exchange of ownership of like stocks and companies is like not something that uh, is like it's a contentious issue because people still s- sort of believe that if you have ownership of a company, it shouldn't be this sort of like speculative endeavor, but that you should have to like bear the the cost, like, you know, the risk of it entirely as opposed to, um, um, you know, being able to sell it essentially. Yeah. And this is like, this is financial technology. People don't think about this way. Yeah. But throughout all of, uh, you know, financial histories, this is something I'm looking, me and Ed, Ed Berger are looking at too, is like, do you have the development of all this stuff like, uh, you know, futures markets and, and things. And it's always accompanied by a lot of, uh, you know, hostility to these developments because basically you're, it's resting on a very abstract kind of idea and that you're, you're abstracting ownership and you're like turning it into these shares or you're, you know, abstracting, you know, is you're making, uh, you know, uh, pay, it's like the same process of making paper money of 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 that kind of currency is that it ha- runs a lot of the same problems because you can run away with yourself and you can create like a huge amount of value uh, basically just through speculation that has nothing to do with the company that is actually uh, in existence and the the business that it does right yeah and so th- this is like the problem that is beginning during this this era and like but this is we're talking about just basic stocks at this point like today we have all types of derivatives and we have extras pyramid and we have like trillions of dollars worth of derivatives that all reference back to each other and all collateralize one another that all represent wealth that doesn't exist but you know when we're opening up the royal exchange it's uh you know we're dealing with just these stocks like the that are like nobody even cares about stocks anymore yeah What's interesting is that the exchange is also, I like your conspiracy theory about coffee because it always ends up being true because the, uh, the Royal Exchange, it opens and right next to it is a uh, Jonathan's coffee house, which is like the first like significant coffee house in London. And it actually opens first. So uh, no, and, and this is in 1562. And oh, it's uh, who's this uh, Thomas Gresham, who's the founder of this exchange? I'm not familiar with him. Uh, I don't know if you are, but you know, this is like the Royal Exchange is chartered by the Queen. The 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 the, the coffee house thing is so funny because this is like, you know, uh, where a lot of the culture comes in that we still have today with like financial reporting. Is because I guess the the people the, the a lot of people weren't allowed in the ex, in the exchange because they were considered to be like too lowly or like not you know mannered enough or not well bred enough, and that they had to basically sit at the coffee house. Yeah, yeah. But it's not even that. Like that happens like later because initially the coffee house is also you're like exchanging for coffee itself. Like with it is like its own commodities exchange because <laughs> coffee is such a rare commodity and like you're like you know you'd be and it had like you know they generally have a lot of spices and stuff and people would spice their coffee a lot at the time also. Um, so you were it, it was like its own commodities exchange in the first place. It kind of is a model for. The, the the more abstracted commodity exchange. It really is, and actually, that's a lot of history of, of finance uh, in in England is basically around coffee houses. If people don't re- people don't realize this is that first of all, art auctions uh, weren't allowed. Like uh, there was a whole thing going on with smuggling of artworks out of Italy, out of like the papal territories, and uh, that was a very controlled. Kind of international trade on art, and it wasn't actually allowed in England at the time uh, because of these treaties that they had. And so that's the scene that all the, uh, they actually had a lot of um, illegal art auctions that would happen out of the coffee houses, but also a lot of trading and also a lot of auctions for like uh, shares of copyrights too. Was that was you know. All based in, in coffee houses, and also the coffee houses were often the be- biggest proprietors of um you know they were the ones subscribing to uh, the like emerging like magazine markets and like newspaper markets because they would have them there. Yeah, they were like the first. Uh, their own uh, to call it a library isn't quite right because it's not like old stuff. It's about like the the kind of like pamphlets and things that you would read and then get rid of. Yeah, this is like the new. Uh, Printing that's going on is with these, you know, uh, you call the newspaper or whatever. A lot of times they're just like one page, right? Broadsides, yeah, yeah. 
And it's like a lot of these are getting built up because there's a huge demand blowing up for them. And this is how they get distributed is that you have a subscription. You come in and you pay a certain amount per month or whatever. And you would be able to sit there and read all the different you know papers that they had gotten in. So this is where a lot of like financial reporting starts. And also just a lot of like all the magazines, like all the newspapers. This is, this is where journalism comes from, like literally. Like these, these, this is the, you know, where the idea of journalism comes from. And, you know, this is where Daniel Defoe uh, comes in too, is like the, one of the first journalists, because this is like the market that he's serving. Yeah. I think from there we could go to like Robinson Crusoe, right? Cause that's such a, yeah. like it's probably the defining myth of the British Empire ultimately is Robinson Crusoe. Yeah, and it's such a like a huge project that they come up with with you know developing the whole world in this way. Because this is why I want to talk about dissent too, because uh Defoe, Daniel Defoe is a dissenter, right? And he's he's uh, this is you know right before the glorious revolution. And so this is what we were talking about, was like all this development of kind of these republican ideas and the development of dissent and the Church of England and the idea of the balance of power and like all this stuff is very linked together. Like this is a very kind of uh, you know maybe not a project that everybody uh, can articulate really clearly, uh, you know, but they try and that's what a lot of the works during this era are, are about is trying to put all these pieces together. Uh, and so the Glorious Revolution is kind of like the realization of that. And everything in between is like a lot of conflict uh, over you know which direction it's going to go. Uh, so, you know, you come out of the English Civil War, and the English Civil War is obviously not about. Uh, I don't know when it gets taught in school, it's like posed as kind of like this uh, proto-American revolution, which it is in a way, but not in the way that they yeah uh, usually make it out to be. What terrible retribution may he not bring down upon our heads? In the name of God, what are we all? Men? Cowering and quivering like downtrodden serfs. The king is not England, and England is not the king. It is not the survival of the king that is at issue here. It is the survival of England. And this king, by his dishonesties, by his treasons, and by his secret treaties with foreign powers, has shown himself to be ill-fitted to govern this great nation. It's interesting because this is also like because of the Glorious Revolution and these sorts of uh, changes, uh, it, it when it plays out in the continent, like I mean, or meaning uh, the New World rather, um, at the same time is. Uh, this is when the colonists sort of first begin to like understand themselves as like a separate or an independent entity because they had been doing their own thing for so long. They'd even been like printing their own coins or, you know, minting their own coins and stuff like that. Um, they had, they were kind of autarkic to a certain degree because there was so much shit going down in the mainland of the British Empire that they kind of were leaving the Americas to just like, you know, do as they will. Uh, just so, like so long as they can like stay afloat and um and like you know pay give get, pay back some profits or whatever, but then when after the glorious revolution they start trying to take a more active um, interest in governing the colonies and this is like the beginnings of the uh, beginnings of the American Revolution really or way earlier yeah and not only that but conceptually too. Because the whole the whole idea is that um, basically you know they they kill the you know uh, when the English Civil War comes about right is that you know you have Thomas Cromwell who comes in and you know he is uh, you know not not so great of a guy. There's actually I'd recommend it if you've not seen the movie. There's a movie with Alec Guinness. Have you seen it, Logo? Yeah. I mean I kinda like Cromwell, but I also like Stalin. So I like them in the same sort of way. Yeah, but I also like the, just the movie. The movie's really funny because of Cromwell in it because it's all based around like he, his hatred of Catholics. Yeah. So there's all these parts <laughs> in the movies. I don't know if you haven't seen it, it's so great because he'll sit there and like there's all these parts where like there's somebody who's there's a crowd of people gathered together of like different, um, you know, uh, 
uh, you know, members of parliament and they're, they're all crowded together and one of them is, is Cromwell. And Cromwell will sit like cross-armed in the corner and he'll look really like stern and he'll, he'll just be listening and someone will be giving this huge speech like uh, calling for uh, toleration or moderation. And he's like, we can't kill all the Catholics. You know, we have to be moderate. And then the whole time Crumb will be, or, you know, he'll be looking at like a portrait of like the Pope or something. And he'll just be listening to this, be like, angrier and angrier. And his, his face will just like drop. It, he gets super pissed. And then like at the climax, he like stands up. He's like, no, let's kill all the Catholics. Yeah. And I love all those scenes. They're so great. Well, that's sort of like where a lot of the Republican stuff becomes a problem, right? Because it's like, uh, well, if it, the religious component of it, right, is uh, do, do you kill all the Catholics or how can you possibly like, um, you know, be okay, like just allow them to exist or like have this toleration of Catholics while at the same time you have like these like hardcore dissenters and like the nonconformists and all these other sorts of things it becomes a huge problem. The problem of like religious tolerance and stuff, which w is obviously like developed in America um, because Cromwell's representing the uh, like the nonconformist Protestants to a degree. And even they are, have their own problems with the Republic because you can't like have a titled office unless you're an Anglican. And they consider Anglicanism to be just like, you know, popery, popery too. It's just English Catholicism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's the same, it's all the same to them. Yeah. And this is like, you know, so this is a, a big, not only is this, when we talk about like religious toleration and separation of church and state, uh, it's usually completely out of this context, even though this is the proper context to understand it. Uh, so when like uh, Locke is talking about toleration, this is the situation that he's talking about. But basically, you know, uh, they execute Charles the first, right? And then uh, they have the civil war period. And so this the civil war is really, con it's actually like multiple kind of conflicts that are going on. Yeah, it's like a lot of civil wars, though. It's sort of like, you know, the Spanish Civil War, like the Russian Civil War, or even the American Civil War, like the idea that it's just this, like, one conflict that ends, whereas, like, you could look at it with, like, Reconstruction and all these sorts of other things, or even World War II, right, where it's like, you know, we beat the Nazis or whatever, but then it goes right into the Cold War. And it's like, when do any of these conflicts begin or end is generally, uh, it's like... Because it, it doesn't end. The, uh, it's, it's tough to say. It, it not only it includes all these actions, first of all, that are going into other, with like Scotland. And that's like a whole, you know, not only is it a civil war in England, but also Scotland is getting involved. And, you know, there's, uh, and religion is a big part of that. And this all is going to continue to play out for a really long time because basically they, they, re, there's first the period of restoration. And that's like, uh, in, you know, 1660. They restore the monarchy after Cromwell dies, right? And uh, the restoration happens. And then that actually doesn't go so well. But then there's a the whole issue of the monarchy becoming Catholic again because of this is happening through James and like his offspring and, uh, you know, James II. It's like, is it going to be Catholic? Because all of a sudden now the monarchs are Catholic and didn't we, haven't we been trying to get rid of this? And so that sets up the Glorious Revolution of 1688, which is then we're actually just going to have, uh, you know, someone from the Netherlands, come from, this Dutch guy come in, you know, and uh, rule us instead. And that is like the constitutional principle of, of England down to this day, is that they set it up then. That was the resolution of it, is they wrote it into their law that the idea of, um, you know, parliamentary, like, superiority. And the, that whole idea is based around the commons and the idea that the commons is basically in charge of England and that the parliament which is representing the commons is that they are outranking the king and that the king gets the power from the commons and the through the parliament and not the other way around, right? Yeah. And so, you know, in that sense, it's like, you, even though they may have a king going into the 18th century... It's like they're uh, in what sense are they uh, monarchies that uh, they're they're not they're a republic and so this is like a accomplishment of of all this conflict all these uh, plans is that now that, you know 1688 they they finally become a republic and they also bring in uh, you know William of uh, you know Prince of Orange they bring him in and that also solidifies kind of this relationship with the Dutch 
And then, you know, later with the King George the the first, he comes in and that, uh, you know, establishes a relationship with Hanover. And so that's like, this is the building of the, of the Protestant kind of like, uh, you know, coalition of nations to, uh, at this point, oppose the French and the Bourbons because, you know, w- one of the first conflicts they get involved with is then uh, the War of Spanish Succession, which is where the Habsburgs, uh, you know, uh, through a succession uh, uh, issue, the Bourbons all of a sudden get control of Spain from the Habsburgs and this starts a war. And then this is like the driving force between of like all the conflicts in Europe that uh, England is participating in over these centuries is that this is what they're all about. This is why England is motivated to be in them is because they're, they're, you know, trying to fight, you know, something like the Bourbons uh, gaining control of, of Spain becoming too powerful. But at the same time, like within England, um, this sort of earlier kind of Renaissance influenced ideal of the Republic, a lot of these people are the ones who go over to the Americas first. Um, like the, like there's a whole sect called like, like of people that have been referred to like more recently as like the Puritan alchemists who they're, they're not exactly like the hardcore dissenters, um, at, but are kind of more like, um, I don't even know how to describe it. They're like, these are like people who are still talking about like Hermes Trismegistus and, you know, a lot of the sort of stuff that comes out of the like Rosicrucian order and stuff. Um, this is the difference between say John Winthrop, the first and John Winthrop Jr. Uh, John Winthrop, the first being obviously the like leader of the Massachusetts Bay colony, which is almost, which is very explicitly, um, like a, uh, dissenter, Puritan kind of theocracy, uh, corporate governance, but it's also kind of a joint stock corporation because, you know, they all are like co-owners of the space and they have, um, <laughs> they have, uh, like basically like, you know, boardroom meetings to decide on what they're going to do with their colony and stuff. But his son is tied into all these alchemical networks and, you know, John Winthrop Jr., his signature, he used the Monos Hieroglyphica from John D like on all of his documentation. And his whole goal was to set up the industrial elements in uh, the early Americas. Like he's scouting for uh, rare earth minerals um, and he s- creates the first uh, lo- like iron forge in America on the Connecticut River. And uh, he, he founds like New London as opposed to the, uh, the like New Jerusalem of um, his father. Oh my God, that's... You know- this is the the interesting part about this is we can talk about like the history of ideas and that's like a really important thing to stress is you know that ideas develop through history and they branch off from one another and they don't just exist this is what a lot of people uh really struggle with is that uh ideas are you know constructive and they shape how we are viewing reality and we're creating them and we're doing that creation through these philosophical processes, which, you know, is often, there's metaphors for it, which get developed in something like alchemy. But when you are going back to the 17th century to these, you know, it's like you, ha- it is a theocracy and it is a corporation and it is like a commutarian, like, you know, collective kind of like futurist organization as well. That's like, it's like a corporation that, uh, you know, all these people belong to and they all live in and they all own part of, and that's, you know, a colony project part. Of, it's like a very complex. It's like a co-op though. Like you could even really like, you know, this is sort of where a lot of the anorexians, um, take off with mold bug and they look at, you know, the Massachusetts Bay colony as being essentially like, why does it have witch hunts? And they're like, well, why do you think there'd be a witch hunt at like, a a co-op? a co-op farm commune farm run by like Antifa people or whatever. Right. Like they would have a lot of witch hunts, right? It's like a struggle session sort of. Right. Um, so in some sense it has this sort of like leftist ideal as uh, people would put it in these sorts of stupid left, right terms. But then, you know, from another perspective, you've got, uh, it becomes like this model for a lot of the more conservative elements bordering on like the theocratic elements in, um, American conservatism, like, you know, this is, he's, John Winthrop is then being quoted by, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan centuries later. Yeah, there's a lot of history to this that goes all the way, uh, it has, it's way bigger than you would necessarily think, because you can talk about Utopia and Thomas More and stuff, but then this is like kind of happening, like, this is what America ends up being developed through, 
is a lot of these different projects. There's a lot of religious colonies and their utopias uh, in the sense that, you know, they're set up in this way and that they're kind of like theocratic corporations for development. And, you know, this continues well into the 19th century. And there's a lot of influences there where even like in the 19th century, the socialists from Europe or refugees of the yeah. uh, 1848, they're all coming in. Yeah. And so like same, even in places where people like that are like pretty like art conservative now, right? Like Texas drew in a lot of these like German immigrants and stuff who were basing their ideals off of like, you know, they'd, they'd end up setting up like statues to like Schelling and Goethe. There's like the Goethe society in Texas, which comes from this, like these sorts of um, more idealistic um, utopian ideals. But this is also the grounds of uh, the Mormons and not just the Mormons, like there's like the whole Mormon wars over the middle of the country, especially in the West, and over the the end goals of their, you know, newly created societies on what they see to be essentially like a blank map because, you know, the Native Americans don't really they don't like for the most part, especially the Plains tribes, they don't have like a they 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 exist by as like nomadic. Like they're moving around. So they don't have like this sort of I, vision of a society that's like in place or permanent. Yeah, I, I mean, we, I want to talk more about this later because this also goes into like the Fabian society. Yeah, and, and there's a lot there. There's actually like a very, it's, you know, a lot of this. This is what I find as we research this stuff more, is that there's a lot more continuity in history than people would think. Is that it's not just weird isolated things. Nothing ever just pops up out of nowhere. Yeah, like that's not even feasible. You get the intellectual history aspect of it. There's these different ideas that are developing as like complexes and they're getting refined and kind of they're separating from one another. So it's not like at this point, they don't have all these separate ideas of like corporations and what that is and, you know, a theocracy and that's that thing. And that it's like all kind of blended together in a way that's, uh, you know, waiting to be developed. And that development happens through history. Uh, but, you know, uh, you get into this this uh, period then with like uh, after the Glorious Revolution, and th- this is going back into D- Defoe. This is why I brought it up because he's a dissenter and he was actually part of uh, before the Glorious Revolution happened during the Restoration. He participates in the Monmouth Rebellion. Is that that's kind of like one of the first things that he does? Uh, you know, in his like twenties, I think. Yeah, and uh, he writes that book on um, trying to like make a compromise for to allow the dissenters in and it basically is hated by everyone right <laughs> yeah it, it, he, that's like that's sort of like his first introduction to the world i don't know i see him as kind of like a bumbling f- figure because he's never he's never that successful in anything i mean he gets he's in this failed rebellion and then like just immediately afterwards the glorious revolution happens anyway so it kind of like nullifies everything that he was doing or that his concerns at the time um, but then, you know, he, he like gets arrested for that. And then, uh, he's a traitor and this is where the economics of it come in. That's really interesting. And why Robinson Crusoe is interesting is because of the economics of it. And he's a, tr- you know, a merchant and he's involved in all these different kinds of businesses and he's never really successful. At any of them, he's always in debt, but he's doing like a uh, trade when like wine and different products like that internationally and he's trading with Europe and he has all these uh, plans for like uh, development in the new world and like making plantations and stuff he's trying to get involved in that and he's like trying to get shares into like factories and it's like start start manufacturers and uh, so he's like all over the place in that sense and he's never really that successful and he's always in debt and then uh, basically it's only in his like kind of 40s that he starts I guess uh, writing a lot and this is like going into the 18th century and he's like combines all these different kinds of genres of writing. Is that he's a journalist, and he's also writing like financial and like uh, industry news, and he's also like uh, writing novels, and it all kind of like blends together. Uh, because Robinson Crusoe is like obviously posed as a true story, uh, and it's kind of like posed as like journalistic reporting, and it's posed it's told in the first person. It's supposed to be like an authentic account. Of Robinson Crusoe, and this is how like all of his his stories work. Uh, yeah, but this is like yeah the main metaphor of the you know the English uh, you know d- world development. I mean, this is like the key point that I want to I guess stress conceptually is that 
this is what the World Bank does today, right? This is like our whole idea of everything is that we're going to basically loan all this money to different countries around the world and they're going to use that money to uh, you know, improve their land and set up businesses and you know, build infrastructure and that that's going to reduce the poverty in those countries, it's going to create jobs, it's going to make people more educated, it's going to you know, ultimately make everybody happier and then there's going to be more global stability and so that's like, you know, going right into the mission of like the United Nations or whatever, is that we want world peace and we want everyone to get along. We want global stability. And so we're going to accomplish that basically by having this thing called the World Bank give huge loans that no countries can ever pay back that then the IMF like holds them ransom for basically and that they have to become like surf nations to, you know, uh, the West and to America. So that like this is like what happens after the war, after World War Two. But you can go back to this basic concept all the way back to like Robinson Crusoe. Like that's the whole idea of like Robinson Crusoe that's like encapsulated in that book. And that's why it's like so important, I think. The other important line, right, is the uh, the East India's com- East India Company, though, because that's like that's sort of the prototype for the World Bank also. Yeah. And the East India Com- uh, Company is such a weird thing because I've had a lot of trouble actually finding uh, sources or like resources on that. And I've gone through library catalogs and a few bibliographies, and there's, you know, actually not a great history of it. But, you know, this we're going to get into this is one of the things is that uh, Malthus was a basically official economist of the East India Company. And so was Adam Smith and Ricardo. And so this is like really important is because a lot of the economic theory that's going to, you know, uh, become very important going into the later 19th century and 20th century is that all that's developed as ideology for the East India Company. And this is where, you know, Darwin is going to fit in. But this is like, uh, you know, Robinson Crusoe is like conceptually kind of like the metaphor that kind of sets it all into motion. And that's why it's a very important, uh, you know, to kind of think about the history of ideas aspect of it when I talk about like how philosophy or, or literature or something, how ideas get developed through that. And a lot of people are always saying like, what's the point of this? Like that's all being on Twitter is now is just like you say anything and somebody's bitching at you. T- yeah, everyone's just saying TLDR all the time. And it's like, what's the, you know, why, why this, why that? It's like, well, you know, literature is kind of important in that sense because literature is the tool, is a, you know, it's almost like a scientific instrument in a way. That you're using to uh, develop an idea, and that you know ideas allow you to see the world in certain ways, and that when you see the world in a certain way, uh, you know it, it that makes it possible for you know a lot of actual institutions and structures and physical things to be built up around that. But you know, having the ideas in the first place, that's kind of a precondition of them. It's not like ideas come, you know, into existence afterwards. And just describe things that already exist. It's like the building of an idea and the building of the thing it describes or it conceptualizes is that those are, that's a symbiotic process. It's that they develop through each other and you know, in parallel to each other. So that's like an important part with Robinson Crusoe is because this is laying the, the huge intellectual foundation here in uh, a literary history that I guess you can go back to Thomas More's Utopia and you can go and connect New Atlantis to that and. Uh, Robinson Crusoe is another one of those. And in Robinson Crusoe, it basically starts off as a slave trader. Uh, and his parents, first of all, don't want him to go to sea if you haven't read the book. I would recommend people just read the book because it's not that long. You can read it in like one day. And it's actually, it's a good book. Uh, and they, his parents don't want him to go to sea, right? And uh, he breaks their their wishes. He goes against them. He becomes a slave trader. Then he gets captured by Ottomans, and then he uh, is becomes a slave. And he has to like buy his freedom. I think he escapes. He gets captured and turned into a slave. I think twice in the book. Uh, but he gets out of it, and then he goes home, and he's thankful to be home. But then he goes back out again, and then that's when he gets into a storm and he gets stranded on this island. And so. This is something that I don't know. Did you see the the Martian logo? Uh yeah. It's basically it's it's Robinson Crusoe on Mars, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's actually you know Robinson Crusoe on Mars is already a, a whole, there's a, a movie of that already before yeah. the the Martian. It's a very classic. Like most of science fiction comes out of this thing. It's this whole idea, right? And I mean, I think back onto like this uh, 
this roommate I had um, in college and we were arguing about like what the point of art was. And he said that it was to envision the future so that it could be made. And like he was just mostly talking about like how iPads exist in like 2001 A Space Odyssey and then they like exist later. So that's basically this sort of model of literature though, which is like the the creation of um a sort of the utopia, right? Of like a utopia or, you know, the uh, in, to inspire like change or production in the real world is what he was saying the purpose of art was. Yeah. And, and I mean, when Robinson Crusoe, this is like, I just bring up The Martian because this is why actually I, I really hated that movie or I just didn't like it because in Robinson Crusoe, there's a very uh, kind of connected, there's a metaphor in the book about. Uh, because he disobeyed his parents, he is, you know, uh, he thinks that he's being punished for that by God and that that's what the situation is, is that he's stranded on this island uh, as punishment for basically disobeying his parents, committing a sin. And so he, this is his situation where uh, throughout the book, he's also engaging in kind of law, law of contemplation and spiritual development. And so the whole thing about like him building up the island and like uh, building all these cool structures and everything, is that that is connected into a, a concept of spiritual development too that is happening concurrently. I mean, it's also kind of like Paradise Lost, though, right? In the, the sense of like he's he's like the Lucifer figure who's like cast out from like his father's affection, and so he has to like you know make a paradise out of hell. <laughs> it is really, you know, it's kind of a deeper concept than you think. I mean, it gets turned into like by Disney or whatever, or it's a it's a book, right? Swiss Family Robinson, and then I've only seen the movie of it. Uh, but you know, it is, you know, there's a fun adventure aspect of it, but then there's also kind of a deeper element of it of, uh, you know, psychological, spiritual development, subjective development that is. Uh, going along with the physical development of the island. And this was one thing that was missing from The Martian. I mean, you know, not that The Martian matters, but just as an aside, why I didn't like it is because it dropped that part completely. And that it was really, you know, it didn't, it, you know... You could say that that's like really the change to neoliberalism though, right? Or it's literally <laughs> just all about the process and there's like no, like there's no internality to the subjects creating these processes anymore. And so, yeah, that's a really, you know, good way to look at it because this is the key to Robinson Crusoe. And this is the key to like the, the whole British empire is that, uh, and it even goes back to Francis Bacon and his idea of like, we're going to build an empire, but also it's like an empire of knowledge and it's based on knowledge. And, uh, you know, it's it's very much these two things are being seen as connected in that, you know, you're not only improving the world, but you're also improving, you know, uh, yourself at the same time. These two processes are fundamentally interrelated, right? Yeah. It, and that these, but that's not how we look at it anymore. I guess you know, you can say that that's actually the legacy of utilitarianism in kind of a way. Is like just se is severing the kind of spiritual aspect of economic development from just praxis. Yeah, absolutely. Now that I think about that, actually, uh, is a good way to put it because that is what ends up happening. Uh, and the thing about Robinson Crusoe is that one of the things that, you know, in my economic education when I was in school is, if you don't know, Robinson Crusoe uh, economies, is that's what it's called, is that they're a very important kind of like concept also not only for the building of economic theory, but especially for pedagogy of, in economics is the Robinson Crusoe metaphor. And, you know, that's how it's basically, like, basically taught uh, and it was taught to me is that you start off with this idea of Robinson Crusoe on his island and he has limited resources and he's an isolated kind of specimen, right? Yeah. And then you are setting it all up so that you are modeling his decision and these are the laws of economics or what is called price theory or the science of decision-making or behavior. And so you're modeling his decision-making and with these utility functions, right? And so uh, when we're talking about the classical debate that we mentioned before about uh, the development of like agriculture into industry and the place of luxuries in that is that that is all based on a physical like, kind of objective hierarchy of what people need and like what they're trying to do is that you know like it was that guy's Maslow's hierarchy of needs I guess it's kind of similar to that yeah but what happens especially in the later 19th century 
is that all gets uh, changed by utilitarianism to be a subjective theory of value where it's not, it's based on just whatever you want, what you want, and that's completely self justifying. That's enough. The theory doesn't care beyond that about why you want it or whether or not your wants are valid or justified. And this is how the rational actor in economics uh, comes about. And that it's, it's, everyone is a rational actor and not the sense that they have, you know, I hate the, the rationalists, uh, the less wrong people and the people on, you know, NRX people and stuff who talk about reason because they're, you know, uh, so stupid about it. But reason in this sense, when you talk about a rational actor, there's, it doesn't have anything to do with the content of what people want, what their preferences are. Uh, you know, it only has to do with their rational in the sense that they're kind of these preferences are transitive and that they have like a, a structure to them that, you know, is subject to quantification. And that's like what rationality means economically. So basically, you're using Robinson Crusoe as a specimen and his island as a laboratory and you're observing his behavior. And this is the basis for like what's called like neoclassical economics or margin. It has to do with the marginal theory of utility. And that's like the first derivative of the utility function and basically how much uh, more happy or less happy you get based on how consumption and like how quickly that happens. Because first derivative is the measurement of this the the rate of change. Yeah. So that's that's what like neoclassical economics is based on, and that's you know Robinson Crusoe is an important uh, kind of aspect of that, and that will go into when we talk a bit more later about the uh, the Victorian aspect of it. Yeah. But I was looking yeah into this history of of how this all comes about in in economics, right? And you know actually uh, it looks like. Uh, Proud Proudhon was like the one of the first people to mention Robinson Crusoe uh, in an economic discussion. Oh yeah, yeah. He was you know there's a few examples of it, um, and Marx in Economic Sophisms uh, 1845 talks about Robinson Crusoe in economics, and uh, this is like you know how we're always talking about Marx being a good. Uh, like a novelist and and being good with literature and having a literary side to him. Yeah, he. I mean, he's he references Shakespeare all the time, but you know, <laughs> get the Marxist reading Shakespeare these days. Yeah, and th- I guess this is something that people don't really get about it is that it's all narratives. These are all fictions that we're talking about, but they build up a lot, and you know, they set the conceptual terms around which uh, all scientific thinking even happens. And so basically, I mean, you have these different early economists using uh, Robinson Crusoe, just invoking him. But then uh, I guess the, the one who sort of, uh, sort of starts developing the model of Robinson Crusoe economy is, uh, you know, comes a bit later in around 1860. And that's right into uh, basically the Victorian era. And his name was W.S. Jevons. And oh, it's from 1871 theory of political economy. Is he's the first one who, I guess is using Robinson Crusoe model for the purposes of building up um, kind of the theory of marginal utility. And we'll we'll talk about that later. But I just think that's so interesting is that you know not only is Robinson Crusoe kind of like an economic metaphor in a way that you could interpret it as that, as such that it could be inspirational to you know people who. Uh, want to become traders or the East India Company, but it really is like you know it's a huge part of economic theory. Even like this is you know you go to school, you learn economics. They're going to teach you Robinson Crusoe first. Yeah, but I, I mean, I think the interesting thing, right, is when we get to like the Victorian age, like as we're saying, the severing of the content of people's wants from like the. the this idea, like where it just becomes totally abstracted, like, you know, where it's just, um, like the rational actor theory is kind of fucked by the East India Company, right? Because what's the East India Company making most of its profits off of is like running opium and like all over the place. And this sort of continues even now, right? Where we use these sort of neoclassical economic models to, to, to design, um, technologies to like with the dopamine uh, like dopamine dopamine responses and things everyone even talks about now um that like that is part of the rational actor theory right is that 
you turn utils into like dopamine bumps and then you're essentially like creating an economy which would like would back like what has no real problem with turning you into like a drug addict and then you dying because that's like all fits into rational choice theory there's no point of being like well these the, the, this notion of like negative wants or negative desires that are like be, like not beneficial to anyone but are actually harmful to everyone that that's there's no such concept no i mean absolutely not this is like a uh, such a big transformation that happens going into utilitarianism and you know this is really we're talking about the history of economics here in the idea of the, the fiction of it. Because not only are we talking about Robinson Crusoe, but the whole idea of the objective hierarchy of needs and wants is that this is going into the, you know, idea of nature, which is itself a fiction, which, uh, you know, that's another thing that people are, you know, yeah, can't wrap their heads around so easily. Nature is just this thing people use to for certain purposes. Like it's not a real entity. Like and in the more like mystical nature people, the more you get obsessed with this notion of nature, the less likely you are to want to define it as something and more the the more it becomes like this uh the god of nature or non, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean and this is actually like a very well established uh, kind of part of the theory that we're talking about. Um, I sent you this this stuff about uh, from Istvan Hunt, and I would actually really highly recommend this book called Jealousy of Trade by Istvan Hunt, because uh, it's one of my like favorite, uh, most insightful books I've read. Because it is this it tells this history of this early kind of economic the history of early economic theory and political economy, and this is really the whole point of it is because we're we're getting into like Hobbes and like Locke and, and, and Pufendorf is what we're talking about with the development of nature and natural law and the state of nature, right? And uh, this, is, this is, first of all, that's what liberalism is based on. This is the first step of it, is the, the creation of the idea of nature. And, you know, you, you, people will always come in and they'll say like, but nature always existed. And people talk, they use the word nature back here. And they said this about nature in this book. And, you know, this poet, he says the word nature. Uh, but really it has nothing to do with uh, nature and the more uh, specific legal and philosophical sense that we mean uh, when, we're, when we're talking about this. Because they're developing a theory of nature that's, you know, very technical uh, and they're doing it in support of these kind of colonial projects that we're, we're talking about, right? And, you know, nature in this sense, it's like, you know, it, you're, you, the, the problem that they're trying to, to address is how society comes about. And they're trying to address problems of uh, coordination. And basically the idea that you have people, and at one time in the past, they were like animals, is that we can conjecture. We can basically, uh, through backwards induction or whatever, uh, imagine that people uh, at some time, they didn't live in society, right? And now we do live in society. So how did that happen? People were able to coordinate their behavior in such a way where they are able to build uh, the civiliz civilization around us. And when we talk about natural law, the law that they're trying to find out is the law of behavior that, allows people to build uh, society out of nature. And that's, those are the laws that people mean when they mean natural law. And so those are considered to be the principles basically of, uh, you know, primordial society. That's how society happens in the first place. So if we can use reason, if we can rationalize and, and derive analytically uh, in our minds these principles, then we will know the basis for all good laws because these are the fundamental principles people use to make society. So if we want to make pro-social like laws, if we know these principles, we can do that. That's the whole I idea of it. But it's it's much more complex than you know just saying like natural hierarchy, good. You know that's not. You know, uh, it's these are huge legal tomes that we're talking about here. Yeah, but this is where like the Darwin, the like Malthusian, like Darwinian sort of um, line comes in, right? Because it's sort of positing that um, with with like the epistemological leap of Darwinism, right? It comes to totally decenter the notion of like reason or accountability or any of these sorts of things as being sort of um, 
secondary like attachments to what is fundamentally still this kind of Hobbesian. Um, I mean, this is where Hobbes gets his notion of like liberalism or, you know, the sovereign and stuff too, is from like emerging out of this state of nature where everyone's like at each other's throats all the time. And so you need a force to make like, these are the, these, yeah. that's why these, these books exist. That's just, this is what they're actually arguing is that, you know, in order to have society, everybody, uh, you know, you, Hobbes is saying you need like a force to come in and impose it on people and keep the, you know, everybody in check because they'll, they'll just fly apart at the seams if you don't. But then Pufendorf comes in and he says, well, actually, uh, you know, the, he, he's making the explicit point back in, you know, when he's writing in the 17th century that, no, Hobbes is telling a fiction that you can't know the state of nature through reason. That's what Hobbes is doing, is that he's using pure reason to uh, deduce the, the actual state of nature as an anthropological state. And, you know, that's obviously a ridiculous notion because, you, you know, this is what uh, the, the debate about this that people have uh, today in popular discourse is that they, they uh, really struggle with this part of it because obviously... Uh, Nobody, nobody's going to admit when you put it that way that you can use pure reason to deduce the, the, the anthropological state of human beings before history started, right? Yeah. But this is exactly what Hobbes tries to do. This is his point. And so, you know, Pufendorf comes in and, um, you know, he's arguing, well, no, actually, uh, we, can, we can set it up differently. And so Pufendorf is drawing a distinction between, um, you know, the state of nature as Hobbes puts it, and he's drawing his, uh, you know, because that's Hobbes's dichotomies. He has the state of nature, and then he has like the state, and you know, that's it. This is dichotomy. But uh, Pufendorf comes in, and he's he's distinguishing it more, and that he's uh, rehabilita rehabilitating the idea of society, which is like not a very important part of uh, ancient Greek political philosophy. Uh, it's only you know, uh, this is. In, when Aristotle talks about it, I think Plato doesn't mention it or, or doesn't talk about it very much, uses it once or something. And Aristotle doesn't really talk about it much either. But, you know, they, they introduce the idea of society, but they're more focused on, like, the idea of civitas and, you know, the political uh, positive formations of the state and, you know, communal civic relationships, that kind of thing. And so the idea of society in ancient political philosophy doesn't get developed very much. But this is where, where Pufendorf is coming in. This is like how he solves kind of these problems of the development of society. Is that he is creating this idea, uh, uh, splitting the idea of the, the state from society. And he's saying that society precedes the formation of a positive political state, like, uh, you know, as a legal entity, as a force that keeps people together. And he's saying that in you know, a primordial kind of communist state could and did exist in the sense that uh, it could be based on society in that in that way. And it wouldn't need a state. But if you're talking about like a tribe or something or, you know, uh, in a very ancient prehistorical community is that you could have people holding property in common and, you know, what they're scavenging and the berries they're picking, stuff like that, you know? Yeah. So they don't require a state. Uh because society can exist before a state, but he was saying that the state requires uh, the development of society, you know, before that can happen, before the state can come into being. And so he's reconceptualizing it all in a very nuanced way, where he's making the, you know, the the natural law. He's basing that on the idea of people, uh, you know, of of their sociability is what they're, he's calling it, and this goes into the idea of what human nature is. Right, this is the whole the, the, the huge debate that they're having: is human nature people are sociable, and that goes into basically uh, uh, the basis of commerce. This is why people are treating with one another. And by sociability, it doesn't mean like you know the people just like to talk and have conversations and you know dinner parties or whatever. He means that. Uh, you know, this is the basis of this. Is, people have wants, right? And that they can only fulfill those wants by living in common with one another, by carrying out different industries, by barter, by commerce. And that is inherently based in the kind of uh, the state of need and want that humans find themselves in nature and, you know, the inherent uh, perfectibility or corruptibility of the human spirit, right? So I mean, there's there's a there's a, a lot of deep stuff there that doesn't really get picked up on so much. 
Yeah. I mean, a lot of that, right, is like the notion of trust, right? Like what is the basis of sociability even before the state? Um, it's the idea that you can sort of like, you know, this is where all the contract theory and stuff comes into, right? Is that you can like make deals to like not just kill each other over things. Yeah, and you, you, this is a, you have a, something called the social contract, and you know uh, these are all fictions. Ultimately, basically, uh, this is what Pufendorf does admit consciously and directly, explicitly in his book is that he's like, this is fiction, and these are conceptual tools in this sense. Is that, that's how they're being treated explicitly. It's not as realities. When we say that, you know, what's nature? Does nature exist? Uh, you know. It, it doesn't. It's a fiction. It's a conceptual uh, kind of toolkit that we've developed that comes about in the 17th century that it consists of all these kind of interrelated concepts. And this is the basis of international law. And this is the basis of global development and colonialism and imperialism, right? Yeah. And this is so this is like, a, you know, a very important kind of thing that they worked out that is the allows liberalism to go forward. It's the legal basis for liberalism. Yeah. I mean, as you said, there's someone just posted um, Hobbes' uh, Leviathan on the timeline. So, what did they They said, like, uh, like one of my idols or something. Oh, mentor from a past life is what someone said about Hobbes. No. Because it's still extremely important. I mean, all of the, these, like, these concepts that undergird, like, liberalism are still what we're talking about when we talk about, like, um, you know, education in uh, political philosophy. Everyone is still sort of interpreting these these same texts yeah uh, you know and this is like the a lot of these ideas that get popular and have a lot of currency with people with like Malthus or or Darwin or anything like that is that people don't understand the real context and the real heritage of these ideas because this is also the context that Malthus and and Darwin are working in right is like is that they're they're uh, not not overthrowing this liberal political theory and you know n- the state of nature or anything they're not overthrowing it is that they're uh you know refining it in a scientific way yeah uh, you know it's uh you know uh, so this is like you know we're talking about um you know this being the ideology uh, or ideologists of the east india company right and that's exactly the the reality of it is that uh you know they're they're developing a new kind of scientific approach in that in that sense, in order to uh, undergird the uh, 19th century, the Industrial Revolution. So th- underneath all of these different eras is are these scientific cosmologies, and you know the the balance of power system that we're talking about that like they're starting with in the Elizabethan era is that's all based around uh, scientific ideas that are coming off Copernicus and, and ultimately Newton. Is a, is a cosmological idea of, of one of balance and gravity and planets revolving around one another. And, you know, it's intimately related with uh, one another. It's a, they, can't, they can't exist without, you know, you can't have the, the political, um, you know, balance of power without this scientific cosmology. I mean, that's why the flat earth stuff is so important, right, to people or like the kind of... Um, sort of fringe questioning of like the Copernican model or, you know, just the contemporary model of the cosmos because people like as the conspiracy theorists in these documentaries will say, right, that like these sorts of scientific cosmologies ultimately are the ground upon which political decisions are made it is like the the literal world picture as like Heidegger would put it later. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, you know, they, they need it to be a flat earth because then like, you know, it, it symbolically w- is the, cl- is closer to like the biblical cosmology, right? Where the, the, like we're not in a, a system in which like we're all in move, like moving around the sun and the sun is also moving and the galaxies are also moving, but it's a sort of station, stationary eternal order of uh, these larger powers that and uh like the earth fundamentally remains the same this is actually like the you know thinking about this way is the best case i've ever heard for flat earth to be honest that's why they that's why they believe what they do though right because like you know they'll specifically be like well look at the un flag like why is it you know what i mean like the it's always tied to a political worldview or you know they'll say that like 
a lot of like the people who are now called like, you know, they're now called like uh, scientific investigation or like, you know, any notion of science is like Reddit or whatever. You know, everyone likes to call everything Reddit now. But that it's because um, they believe that, you know, the scientific worldview is, it, that undergirds like modern liberalism has to be dismantled in order for anything to change, which is probably true. Right, it is true. I mean, I don't even know. They don't really get into it that much and think about it that way. They just want to go back to an older cosmology. Yeah. They don't want to like develop anything out of this. Like you know, that's they just want to like you know eliminate <laughs> the like that, that's why they're doomed fundamentally because they can't develop from the model we have towards a better model that incorporates the model that we have now, like as content to like a greater world picture. They want to just like eliminate. Um, certain ideas. Yeah, and you know, this is actually another another point that uh, I just remember that we were talking about before is the uh, Bacon's uh, the one who's kind of coming up with an idea, or he po- uh, posits a metaphor of the expansion of science as being based in, in a journey. It's like a a, a trip, um, and that's so you know it's really connected into all of this is that. And something like Robinson Crusoe, uh, these sea voyages, uh, you know, are literally, you know, it's all, this is the basis of scientific growth, and this is the basis for imperialistic growth. And it's the basis of uh, Darwin's self-mythology, right? Where he, he <laughs> goes um, out into nature on his uh, scientific voyage, ostensibly, you know, to have pure contact with nature. And then he happens to derive, like, as Marx said, he happens to derive the British class system. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was a really good, a really good quote. Uh, it, it, and it's crazy because that's, you know, even that's based on kind of Robinson Crusoe in a way, because now all of a sudden, you know, they're treating nature as a kind of a, a laboratory uh, in the same way that economists are treating the Robinson Crusoe's island. Well, like the idea is literally that like every organism is itself like this experiment with um, like the scientist being like nature, like, you know, eliminating the like results that don't go anywhere. Like if every, if like, this, if, like, you know, this is like the Dawkins connection between genes and memes is that um, every gene is a type of information. It's like a thesis for uh, operating like a protocol for a thing to exist in the world and like procreate itself. And then, you know, it just iterates. And if it's like able to do so, then it survives. And if it isn't, then it doesn't. And that's like the same model for um, like the laboratory like it, it's the idea that you know every thing in existence is in like the laboratory of the world. Yeah, you know, and that's and that's a great point too. And this is like what my criticism, I guess, of like evolution is is just that it lacks any you know, like connectivity, uh, a, a sense of holism, I guess, in nature. And this is, I guess, the source of that problem is exactly what you just said. Is that for somebody like Darwin, he's he's treating all of these different specimens, uh, you know, as if they're isolated. Uh, you know, scientific experiments. Yeah, this is what a Nabo- why Nabokov has a, an issue with Darwin, which is like a very underrated part of. Oh, what, is, what does he say? Because he he's talking about specifically the kind of network dynamics of like interspecies communication, and he's using butterflies very specifically because like the camouflage of butterflies, right, is not like it's not just designed to. Um, to of to mimic specific things in the world um to like blend in as camouflage but it's also doing that on a couple of different levels for different um in reaction to other creatures right because there's he 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 puts it this way that there's like a certain amount of like wit or something to the to the process that can't just be described by um natural selection no th- yeah because like it's the the level of uh, mimesis is so close to reality that it, it's not like it's avoiding its own natural predators, which don't even have eyes as um, capable of like as like human eyesight. But in like human eyesight, which is one of the better um, optical processes that exists, like when it comes to the various types of eyes in the animal kingdom. It's uh, good enough to fool those, and it's like our human beings like a massive problem for butterfly populations. Not necessarily. 
No, no, this is like true of like every, you know, uh, kind of evolutionary story. I don't know. I didn't, you know, we didn't get full into uh, Kipling. Yeah. But this is exactly what I meant when I mentioned Kipling is because, you know, obviously, uh, you know, Kipling is really well known, I think, to a lot of people because of his like colonialist bent and his stories. He's like a good, he's like a, a good British you know, gun ho kind of like whatever tally tally ho kind of guy, right? And you know, all these adventure stories. Yeah, I would uh, mention a uh, Thomas Love Peacock. There's like a whole like the history of um, employees of the British East India's company uh, making literature is interesting because it's like a whole school of people who they're like in the East India offices and they're like bored and they barely do fucking anything. So a lot of them are writing stories. Yeah, this is actually a good one. I don't know if you have you seen the movie with Sean Connery and. Um, uh, whatever his face is, uh, the man who would be king. No, I haven't seen that. Uh, Michael Caine, Sean Connery. That's that's a Kipling story. That's a, and you know, it's a story that Kipling is. I don't know if he's in the original story that he wrote, but uh, there's a character in the movie of Kipling, and it's actually really, it's a great movie. It's a great adventure story. But this is kind of like the point of. Has, there's an ideological element to all of these all these different kinds of literatures, uh, where you know they're uh, trying to support, you know, uh, romanticize. Uh, all these these foreign places, and you know that's the, you, you have whole, all this post colonial criticism that deconstructs that kind of like clumsily, and you know uh, has been doing that for a long time. Uh, but the reason I, I brought up Kipling is just because of uh, he has this stuff called just so stories. Yeah, uh, and that's what evolution. That's what all these. Whenever anybody talks about evolutionary explanations, that's always what they're. It's, you know, it's a just so story. It's literally what Kipling writes in 1902. Uh, he has this collection of just so stories for little children, and it's just like all these. You know how the 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 whale got his throat, how the camel got his hump, how the rhinoceros got his skin, and it, it just explains all these natural things. But it, it, you know, it's through these very simple kind of like little uh, fables for children, and you know, there's an evolutionary. Uh, how did Chad get his girlfriend? Yeah. <laughs> But it's exactly is is exactly the same thing. Is that obviously Kipling's stories are are, are meant to be entertaining and fictional and funny, uh, but the actual evolutionary stories that people use all the time that seem like you know common sense is that they're really no different than that at all. Yeah, is that there? You know, how did the, how did the butterfly get his camouflage? Is like, you know, well, it makes sense on a certain level in the just so kind of way of. You know, it needs to camouflage itself from predators. But then, when you actually think about it more, it's like, well, why did it need to develop to this level of sophistication? Right? Is it didn't? So there must be more to it than than just that. Yeah, and the question, of, but like you know, within the frame of its own understanding, there can't be anything more than just like a utilitarian explanation, because like the whole theory is coming out of this school, which like denies any possible other explanation, right? Like everything just has to have the utilitarian explanation. And this is like, you know, tied to also like the, it's the elimination of like spirit, the spirit fundamentally, like spiritual development and all of these sorts of things. Because the, what is the utility of a uh, spiritual development? Like on its own, like unhindered. And this is what people say on Twitter too all the time, right? They're like, what's the point of learning about all these things or like, you know, complicating your understanding of the world? Because they're saying like, well, like what does it help you do or create or make or buy? You know, well, how, do, what, what like evolutionary role does it have in that sense? And you know, I mean, this is like going into going into Darwin and his like early background because this is exactly what happens with the development of Darwin and his theory, right? Is because he has his grandfather Erasmus Darwin. Uh, and this is from the, the Political Descent book. Is that his grandfather is Erasmus Darwin? And uh, actually, I was surprised about how many radical ideas that uh, Darwin was growing up around. Yeah, he was like he was like growing up like. He he is de- like in the his his family is like anarchists. Yeah, his, his and this is literally the the case because uh, his grandfather Erasmus Darwin is friends with this guy uh, William Godwin, who is literally the first anarchist. Yeah, he's not even like we're not even just saying he's like he's an early anarchist or you know whatever he's one of the first, like he's literally considered the first anarchist. We're not saying he's like punk rock, but like philosophically, yeah, he's considered to be the first anarchist. And, uh, you know, 
he is uh, a very interesting, interesting guy. I mean, I've read his novels before. He's a novelist. He's most famous for having Shelley swoop his daughter. Uh, yeah, that's one thing. Uh, I don't know. People, people don't know about uh, about that. But this is also like where Frankenstein comes from. Is one of his books called Saint Leon. Uh, is a novel that's very similar. Uh, but he also has a book called Caleb Williams, a novel, which is like, a, a, you know, a political thriller. It's like, you know, one of the first ones of those. It's like the enemy of the state or something yeah. of like the early 19th century, right? Uh, and so he writes about these different kinds of themes, uh, but he's also like writing all these political kind of tracks and stuff. And he's dealing with the French Revolution, and, you know, uh, in the 1790s, and he's debating with Burke, right? And this is kind of like, uh, you know, a big jumping off uh, jumping off point in a lot of this, because obviously Burke is the, you know, the patron saint of American conservatism through... God. Uh, you know, yeah, <laughs> through, through the Buckleyites, uh, through Russell Kirk and his, you know, conservative mind. Uh, but, you know, Godwin is... Very opposed. He's like the alternative to that. He's like trying to be a third, uh, third positionist, if you will, uh, between uh, the Jacobins and uh, you know the 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 Burkeans. And this is kind of like the the ideology that Darwin is raised in. Like this is the what he does at his grandfather's house, right? Yeah, but he slowly starts going uh, the other way, like based based solely off of his uh, choice of like his like Malthusian uh, metaphor, which then gets like developed beyond him by like Huxley, who people were calling uh, Darwin's bulldog because he was like <laughs> doubling down on uh, natural selection. And a lot of these terms, right, aren't even things that Darwin comes up with. Like the term natural selection is uh, from Spencer. Yeah, there, and you know, a lot of it's really interesting uh, too because. They're into Lamarck, like Erasmus Darwin uh, is a Lamarckian. So Darwin is like obviously already learning about evolutionary ideas from the very beginning of his life. Basically, is that he's getting exposed to the, the they call it transformationism or transmutationism was the original word for evolution. So like fucking alchemy, dude. <laughs> <laughs> but and this is like a very different. I was actually trying to find books about Lamarck and usually it's in context of discussions of Darwin. Like how he's wrong and stupid and stuff, yeah. Or, or, yeah, or it's like always in discussion of, uh, context of discussion of Darwin of like, you know, uh, you know, how Lamarck influenced Darwin and, you know, uh, what his theories can tell us today about the development of Darwin. And it's like uh, very little uh, in terms of writing about Lamarck himself and his ideas. Uh, but Basically, my understanding of it is that Lamarck is somewhat like a vitalist. Uh, you know, yeah, he gets like rehabilitated by uh, Bergson. Yeah, yeah, uh, and that's like a. I guess Bergson and Darwin then are like the two poles of like Lamarckianism that it goes in in these two different directions in a way. Yeah, it's kind of weird though because a lot of like um, the. Like there's different, it's like interesting how it appears on like the radical right because there is like this, this divide, like this attempt for like a vitalist Darwinism. But at the, but like that ultimately ends up being sort of like neoliberalism, um, like just kind of like British imperial utilitarianism as like a far right position. Um, but then there was like the vitalists who were, who were going like, uh, it, it develops in so many weird ways is what I'm saying because. They're like this idea of Bergson's is more he's trying to make like a democratic vitalism, I suppose you could put it that way. Um, whereas there's like the hierarchical vitalism. Yeah, it's it's like it's a, the the conceptual history of it is like so fragmented. And so, you know, when we're even talking about vitalism, it's like, I guess the kind of vitalism that's popular on the right is uh, Heraclitus uh, and, you know, uh, ideas about like everything is fire or whatever. And that's like, you know, uh, really the extent of vitalism. It's all just energy, man. Yeah, this is like, I don't even know when people talk about vitalism online, they don't really mean anything more specific than that as far as I can tell. That and a sort of like attempt to ground yourself in a pre-civilized or pre like, you know, to, to exist before society where, you know, it's just the weak, the weak should uh, fear the strong, these sorts of things. Yeah. 
And so that's a state of nature yeah, yeah. kind of thing. I mean, this is, you know, obviously it's all state of natures. It's all, this is, you know, come, just comes right back to Hobbes and, you know, I'm going to kick your ass in the state of nature. And this is, you know, uh, this is exactly what uh, you know, the, the continuity, the flow here of it all is, uh, you know, you start out with these kind of Hobbesian fictions about the state of nature and the war against uh, all against all. And then you can go right into these, you know, Darwinian survival of the fittest. And then you can go right into, uh, you know, behavioral psychology. And you can go uh, right into B.F. Skinner, right? And this is exactly what, this is the whole line of it. Yeah. Of like, you know, this is Pavlov. Yeah, this is nature. And in the state of nature, uh, you know, what does it matter if you have a fancy philosophy, man? I'll just punch you. Right, and this is like this is the uh, people think that this is a there's something uh, to this, but they don't realize that this is actually kind of like the basis of liberalism is what they're actually saying. Yeah, actually, <laughs> I was I was gonna say once something I'd recommend for you to see. Did you were you uh, did you ever watch Doctor Stone or read Doctor Stone the manga? No, I never heard of. It. It's basically like there. It's um. It's very Robinson Crusoe. So the idea is that the protagonist is like a science nerd. He's like knows everything about science, right? And everyone in the world becomes uh, petrified into stone for some reason. <laughs> it's like very mysterious. And uh, he wakes up like four thousand years later in this sort of uh re- like a, a, all of society is returned to um like basically like tribal encampments and stuff. There's like very few survivors and he's trying to like re like build up like scientific progress in this world. But the first thing that he has to do, right, is like he figures out how to decalcify people. That's one of the first thing he discovers. And, um, so he's decalcifying people and that, but they're being threatened by like lions and tigers, right? So he has to decalcify the strongest guy that was like in his high school. But this guy, and then this character, he, he decides to create, um, instead of the scientific future, he's like, no, our society that we had was like degenerate and it was all, it was like a gerontocracy and it was like bad for the young. So I'm going to create like the kingdom of might and I'm only going to like recalcify like the best specimens <laughs> of humanity. And he has like this eugenics project. Project, right and uh then the whole thing is about like their battle and like he has to like you know he has to like uh finally he pretends to a good anime he pretends to die he does like a whole jesus myth where he has to like do his scientific developments in, in secret <laughs> it's pretty good oh yeah i don't know this is better than like uh sometimes i remember i did a podcast once it wasn't really even a podcast i mean somebody wanted you know had me do one and the guy was just talking about like uh this uh, anime about like dragon dragon women and how they had like big tits or whatever it's like what the fuck three men jumped ship last night churchill was one of them you don't seem surprised now that it's happened no i'm i'm not i'm not surprised and i must say i'm no longer surprised myself when i see the example being set by my first officer just look at yourself man look at the way you're dressed come on no better than one of these natives. At least I am no worse. I think your brain has been overheated, sir, and your body overindulged in sexual excess. I have done no more than any natural man would do. No. You've done no more than any wild animal would do. It always makes me laugh, but whenever men lose their self-restraint, they always say they're natural. They are more natural than men who have nothing to restrain. Mr. Christian, you will report to the ship before sundown. Is that understood? No. No. What did you say? You said no? Is that what you said? Is that what you said? No. All right. You will report to the ship immediately. Do you understand me? And you will stay on the ship. There will be no more mixing with the damned degenerate natives of these islands by any of my officers or by any of my crew. You comprehend my meaning, sir? God. Yeah. No, that's the shitty anime. No, the best anime is like the hyper is like where they're literally just like, like they've taken the, the sort of literary projects that used to exist (laughs) in the West and like they still run with it. Like they care so much more about like the history of the West. This is the Robinson Crusoe. Yeah. All this sort of shit. And they think about it, you know, and they like produce things with that understanding. Oh, because we, we, we program them. We gave it all up. Like we just have fucking Marvel movies, man. Oh, that was actually, you know, this was smart of like us and like, uh, you know, Margaret Mead to like brainwash all Japanese 
society after World War II and like implant all of our uh, projects in them so that they can continue it as like uh, you know spaceship Japan or whatever after the world, like America falls. They're they're like I mean that's the Kajev thesis ultimately is that like they like you know as being this like post historical society they're they're like the they're like the only real place in the world because they like their whole history is just based off of this and like kind of consciously though in a way that we're not like we still believe there's this continuity to like you know Edmund fucking Burke like we're talking about Burke to justify the this this system we have now if it's insanity like you can't even talk about the founding fathers to justify the system we have now you can't like you have to only talk about like the post fucking World War II order it's like a totally new thing yeah and it's history is what we're looking at, right? It's like this kind of occulted history of like fucking secretive commercial deals and shit. Like that's like our history, really. Yeah, and you know King Arthur conquering America and John D and he, the, the the papal spies burning uh, documents that proved King Arthur uh, was the rightful ruler of the of the American territories. It's like uh, you know this is the the real history of things, believe it or not. It turns out. And th- this goes with like Darwin too. I mean, uh, you know, this is like a. I guess what's in- been interesting to me to me about this whole era of the 19th century and Darwin and stuff is that is this kind of like pr- the proto cybernetics. Uh, like everything that happens later is like laid out here, really, in a lot of ways. And we we still live in like the Victorian era, like every like that's the real defining time like the I, I i like the elizabethan era because the elizabethan era still has this sort of promise of like an alternative to what becomes like the victorian age which is like the opposite tendency that's why cyber that's why steampunk stuff is popular right yeah oh yeah right like all this sort of 19th cent like late 19th century turn of the century stuff and it's, it's so weird we're kind of going through a similar time because this the steampunk stuff is like Kind of missing like the all this important stuff that uh, I've been finding out about reading about this, uh, but you know, uh, just to go back to like Lamarck uh, and the development of like Darwin and stuff is so like there was obviously already an evolutionary theory that's being developed, you know, when Darwin is a kid, and this is what his grandfather Erasmus is working on, and so uh, Erasmus is friends with uh, William Godwin, and I didn't know this, but actually Aaron Burr, you know, the guy from the Hamilton musical, yeah, is that he was actually, uh, you know, he got left America after that, and then he went to uh, Europe, and he he was part of this circle too, and then also, you know, the the Shelleys. Or, or, or in this too, like you said, because his daughter gets swooped by Shelley, and then you know they're they're both uh, famous authors as well. So this is kind of like the you know the circle that Darwin is growing up growing up in. Yeah, it's uh, man, and they're all Lamarckians, and you know, but like this, like we talk about like Huxley or whatever. A lot of these like names like recur, right? You're talking about like Darwin. It could be Erasmus Darwin, or it could be like the Darwin most people are talking about. But the same thing with like Huxley. Like a lot of people think like Thomas Huxley. They're thinking like Brave New World, um, but he's very much in the lineage of his old man who was a like Darwinian theorist, or like you know he wrote about evolution and things. And he was like a very much a utilitarian, and um, he he lays the groundwork for yeah what will later be the like British imperial project in the post war period to create like a global governance and to base it off of like these utilitarian principles. It's like laid out pretty clearly in like Brave New World. Um, all of these people are very much involved in like the the like British invasion, like counterculture in America. Um, yeah, it's wild shit. Yeah, and this is and this is where the Fabians uh, come in too. Yes, the Fabians. Yeah. Oh my God. And this is like it's crazy uh, how it actually uh, develops because the author of the Brave New World. I mean, uh, this is the Fabian Society, and, and this includes uh, Aldous Huxley. But then what we're talking about is that also uh, b- you know before Aldous Hus- Huxley, there is also. Uh, Thomas Henry Huxley, who is a, a you know one of the main kind of uh, people in the debate that's going on about evolution after you know around Darwin, right? Uh, and that's actually has a whole you know crazy connection too to this guy named uh, you know Richard Owen, 
And there's like a whole, there's a lot of stuff here that, that uh, people don't, don't necessarily pick up on. And it's, you know, with, uh, with Darwin, with the Darwin family, I mean, this is like a transformation that's happening with Darwin and his family. It's not decontextualized in, uh, of the narrative that, that Darwin is giving of himself as a great explorer or whatever. That's the, that's the point is that this is another fiction on top of all these fictions. You have the fiction of nature and the state of nature and what people are like in that. And then you have uh, these economic kind of fictions about, uh, you know, Robinson Crusoe and, you know, global development and improvement and all this stuff. Uh, you know, Darwin is just putting another fiction on top of this that's actually not only serving to as a promotional vehicle for his, uh, you know, scientific theory within Victorian society. I mean, he's telling a story about it's obviously has a popularizing function. But then this is also, you know, like we connecting into the justification for the kind of science that he's doing. As like he's the, you know, going into the, the laboratory of nature and uh, observing uh, these creatures in isolation and making, uh, you know, inferring the principles of their operation using his, you know, uh, Victorian rationality. And what is that even possible to do? I mean, what's the basis for that? The basis is Malthus, right? That's what it comes down to, which is the uh, Malthusian growth model, which is the, you know, the, the, the boom and the bust of the economic cycle. <laughs> yeah, uh, and this is like crazy because uh, this is, uh, you know, the way that Malthus is being used here uh, is so important to the whole history of economics. It fits right in there into that debate that they're having going back to uh, Montesquieu and everything with a territory and versus, you know, the Republican states and uh, commerce versus agriculture, right? Uh, uh, you know, Malthus is speaking within a larger tradition, not just making a scientific theory in isolation. And you can't take it out of context because it actually means a lot uh, within the history of this discipline of economics and also the political history of, of the era that he's, he's working in. It's, you know, that's intimately connected to what his idea is. The, like, important thing, right, is that this, like, the, the tie, like, the belief of like natural law is tied directly to um, sort of economic realities or people's understanding of political economy. They become like the same thing because like this is why there's even the notion that you can apply Darwin to human societies or to economics or to ideas themselves with like meme theory and stuff is the idea that every single one of these things has the same structure and follows like the same laws. They're like universal laws. And this is actually interesting too because the way that like the internet meme ideology people do it, I'm just going to put them on the, the shit level. This is why they suck uh, so much is because, you know, like you said, they're doing the universalist uh, Darwinianism where basically all they know is they went through this whole kind of journey or whatever of like being on Less Ron and reading Dawkins and being like kind of a post-2004, uh, you know, anti-George Bush, anti-evangelical Republican alliance that's the background that they're coming from. And so they read Dawkins and then Dawkins is like the only thing that they know. So they just try to apply uh, natural selection to everything. And that's like their only model. But, you know, really that's the basis of systems theory and the sense that that is a universal systems approach. Then that is, uh, you know, much more refined and at a much higher level where that the ultimate point of it is to conceptualize biological systems uh, sociological systems, economic systems, uh, you know, military defense systems as all being, you know, s systems and there being one theory to govern all of them, right? And so, you know, this is, uh, Darwin is involved in kind of the early uh, process of that, that development. It's a very key moment in the Victorian era where this is happening because this is where, uh, if you don't know, Charles Babbage is also working at the same time and Babbage is the, a guy, uh, you know, who developed something called the difference engine, which is a huge mechanical computer. Uh, and this is, you know, one of the, he's really a huge pioneer on the computing in that way is that 
you know, this was a, f- they built it after he died in the 20, the, much later in the 20th century. Is they, they actually built a functioning version of his model, of his plan. Um, but it is like an actual huge mechanical calculator, right? Um, and this is where Darwin is getting ideas from too. Because Darwin has his theory of like the, the divergence of species. And the metaphor that he's using is the specialization of labor. And so it can't be disconnected at all. These are the two, two exactly the same things. I mean, is these economic ideas are being taken by Darwin and being developed into biology directly because this is the con- this is the source of Darwin's knowledge of uh, specialization of labors is from Babbage. And Babbage is an industrial uh, technologist, and not only did he work on the computer, but he's also working on industrial efficiency issues and like factory design and shit like that. So you can see there's like there's a deep, deep connection that goes way. Uh, you know, it's not biology. It's you know, this. There's a fictive le- layer there of mythologizing about what this actually is, and really, it's like you know, uh, part of the ideology of Victorianism. And what's weird is that, I mean, I think everyone kind of, it's, it's rarer to find people who don't think in these terms than not because they're shared by almost everyone, like on whatever side you're going to talk about, whether you call it the left or the right, because you have all these people talking about like climate change and these sorts of things. Um, and like, you know, peak carrying capacity and overpopulation and stuff. That's not like the sole pro- property of these, like, like the radical right or like the Kaczynskiites or something, or the people who believe that, like, um, you know, our civilization is like doomed because, uh, for, for Malthusian reasons and Malthus appearing as fucking Thanos in, in fucking, uh, the, the Avengers movies, like these sorts of, Things are so pervasive; it's everywhere. I, I'm I'm like a little distracted because I just saw this on Wikipedia, which is a, uh, th- this sentence is something I didn't know. Which is the term "doomer" was brought into popular lo- use in the commentary surrounding Jonathan Franzen's 2019 essay in the New Yorker. <laughs> like, what? Apparently, Jonathan Franzen wrote about um, like climate catastrophe in a piece called what if we stopped pretending and he uses the term <laughs> doomer which he got from twitter i imagine what <laughs> holy sh- that's so stupid well that just shows that everything's really downstream from that right because fucking jonathan franz is writing about doomers oh my god hey, uh, but you know this is another thing i, I realized too about erasmus darwin and the uh, he was uh, i guess also friends with Joseph Priestley, uh, and Priestley, I guess, is best known for uh, being a chemist and for discovering oxygen. And like, uh, you know, he's he's connected with flossogen theory, which you may have heard of, which is about like what's combustible in the air that you know causes fire to burn. Yeah. But then also, if you don't know, if, uh, I know Priestley more in connection of his charts and diagrams. Is that he's actually a huge. Uh, Joseph Priestley is a huge kind of important person in the development of, uh, you know, making big charts and charting information. Uh, uh, he has some beautiful charts, man. He has his, you know, he's really world famous for some of these these charts of the chart of biography and like the the uh, new chart of history from 1769. You should go look at them. They're fucking beautiful. Uh, but they're they're huge fucking giant charts uh, that are mapping like history or, or bi- uh, you know different biographical information. Uh, you know, and so this is a time that's coming about where you know this is part of the the kind of set of developments that we're talking about is that this is a scientific innovation of just Joseph Priestley's charts is just, you know, the data visualization. And so, you know, the, you're obviously running into kind of these very modern problems at this time, uh, you know, when Darwin is growing up, uh, as you kind of leave the 18th century and, you know, go beyond the, the French Revolution and beyond Napoleon is that you're getting into these big data problems and data visualization and, uh, you know, computers. That's why Charles Babbage is making uh, the computer in the first place or what his vision of it is, is because, uh, you actually needed, uh, books back then, uh, for tables of like logarithms, uh, and, you know, solving solutions to polynomials. And so they had a, a big function uh, back in, the, in those days because you couldn't sit there, like if for like naval gunning was uh, 
maybe an example of like how to what angle to put the barrel of the gun at for the distance of the target. And so there was like, you know, a formula for that, but obviously if we have sailors and shit, they're not going to be able to do that math for every situation on the fly. So they would have just books that would just print the results of all the different possibilities, right? That would, you know, and so that's what the computer is being developed by Charles Babbage to do is actually to industrially produce uh, those kinds of charts with precision because he was disappointed that they weren't accurate, the books that he had, because the human beings were doing it before by hand and lots of errors compiled through them. And so he was literally designing a machine to do it. And not only did he have a, uh, you know, a machine to do the calculation, it was actually had a, a printing press connected to it that would automatically print out the uh, results of the, the you know the calculations, so that there would be no human error in it at all, and it would be able to produce this as like a giant machine on an industrial scale. And then you know he uh, goes into uh, refines his idea for the difference engine. Uh, which is he just uses an algorithm to solve these polynomials, but then he he builds a, you know designs a general purpose like Turing machine kind of computer, which is like programmable and which uses cards, or uh, uh, you know uh, punch cards. Yeah, he got help with that from uh, Ada Lovelace. Yeah, she, everybody loves her, Byron's daughter. It's it's fun. Yeah. It's a fun little thing though, like all these connections. Yeah, uh, but yeah, it's like the with that with that though with that computer uh you know the interesting thing about that too is that the punch card system was actually developed for looms in the first place i mean it's like yeah you know uh, 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 there's a whole it's all about industrial efficiency guys <laughs> and it's all about industrial systems and machines and machine world and like technics and like mechanics and that's like you know this is in the victorian era the this is the hell world that's being spawned out of this and darwin is like in the very middle of that yeah. And that's why, like, we are like, you know, people talk about the aesthetics of America being shitty and stuff. And it's like, well, it's because it's created to be an efficient machine. Like, it's not created for any sort of like spiritual betterment, right? It's just about uh, efficiency. You know, uh, you, what is it? Um, there's the whole like architectural thing where it was like, uh, beauty is use or something. Well, who says that? Uh, form is function. Form is function, rather. <laughs> because, you know, and this is like exactly the, the transition that Darwin uh, makes away from his grandfather. Because this is what the Lamarckianism is about, is that they're vitalists in this sense, right? Yeah. And so Lamarckianism is, a, is this belief that he believes in spontaneous generation, which, you know, is maggots like, you know, generating out of flesh. And uh, that that's his idea of uh, how life is happening is that it happens in organic compounds are, are basically spawning organic, uh, you know, micro forms of life. Uh, but then his idea through his vitalism is that there's like a super sensible force of some kind that's, uh, you know, running through life that has like a teleological uh, function to it that's developing life into more complex forms. And that is organizing, uh, you know, matter into uh, higher structures. And that's like humans are the pinnacle of that or, or, or whatever. And so this is exactly what Darwin basically rejects and embraces Malthusianism instead. And this is like, so he's basically, uh, you know, that's the history of, of his theory. This is right here, dude. It says, according to the Lamarck's theory of evolution, um, anatomy will be structured according to functions associated with use. By contrast, in Darwin, form precedes function as determined by selection. Yeah. And that's so weird. It's like, you know, uh, it's... You know, the way that Darwin basically, the fact that Darwin bas like turns his back so much on his grandfather in that sense, I think is uh, a bit telling. The way that this book is putting it too, because uh, we could talk about, uh, let me see what the passage is I have it marked. Uh, it's from his brother, his brother's relationship. And it's actually, you know, deeply connected to these utilitarian projects because he comes back from his journey and then he, uh, you know, comes back and his brother, who's also named Erasmus, right? He comes back and gets introduced into his brother's circle. And uh, I don't know, was his brother having an affair with this lady, uh, Martin, Martin Al? 
is her name. She's a female sociologist. Uh, she's considered to be the first female sociologist, I guess, according to Wikipedia. Uh, but his brother had a very deep relationship to this woman, Harriet uh, Martinow. And this was the social circle that Darwin got introduced to when he comes back from his voyage. And he is in the process of kind of like cataloging all of his research and everything, all the specimens he had sent back and he's compiling shit. And so uh, socially what's happening is that his he's living in close proximity a couple doors down, I guess, from his brother. And his brother is like basically having an affair or something with this Harriet Martineau. And, uh, you know, this is the kind of the social world that he's uh, trying to get into. Yeah, and her circle is uh, what? Thomas Malthus, uh, John Stuart Mill, uh, Elizabeth Baron Browning, Thomas Carlyle. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. And so, and this is the context in which he turns his back on his grandfather's. Uh, you know, his whole heritage is his Lamarckianism and uh, his the anarchism of 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 Godwin and all this stuff that he had been raised in is that he uh, goes through this torturous process where he rereads all this stuff that he grew up with and all these people that I guess he he must have known. Uh, you know, being at his grandfather's house when he went to visit. And he just like uh, rereads it all and has to reject it in favor of Malthus because uh, Harriet Martineau is a big uh, proponent of uh, pover- of pauper laws, of reforming them to implement workhouses. And this is so important because fuck the poor. It's, you know, they got to work. You can't give, you just can't just, if you give them money, it's like feeding the animals at the zoo, right? And then, uh, you know, they won't learn how to make their own money. And then, uh, you know, you're actually doing them a disservice, which is still the argument today, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, no. And this is, uh, what, 1838 is when this is, is going on. And Darwin and coming back, uh, you know, and so I guess basically what happened is that, uh, there was a political realignment in uh, Act of 1832, Reform Act of 1832. And this is changing kind of the class uh, stature of the Darwin family. And this is what it all comes down to, is that they had been excluded kind of like from the political majority uh, previously, before 1832. And then there was a reform to uh, basically bring people like Darwin's family into uh, the the peerage, basically, <laughs> yeah, into the Whigs, into the Whig, uh, you know, uh, dominant party at the time, and to bring them into the fold, and uh, you know, because they wanted to, uh, you know, support the emerging uh, industrial class of you know these little mill class investors bourgeoisie investors and this is the political economy of it and it's all designed to just eliminate like you know the threat of uh, socialism right because that's what they're defining it against they're using these people who like they create like that this is what the whole point of the fabian society is is to do like reformist mm-hmm. um like reformist socialism like a kind of third way or, or whatever as opposed to like having a revolution and and so i guess everybody is in this context the Darwin is in is that they're all dis- still discussing Malthus at this time. And, uh, you know, then the Malthus is, so he's directly the background of this uh, workhouse debate that is going on. And this workhouse debate is being influenced by Jeremy Bentham. <laughs> and this is like the, what utilitarianism is, uh, you know, uh, kind of being used to prop up, and Jeremy Bentham, he's the designer of the Panopticon. So, if you want to like look at it, you can go on Google Images or whatever, and uh, you know, look up these uh, panop- uh, you know, panoptic workhouses of the Victorian era. It's some grisly fucking shit. Uh, you know, it's the open office plan, man. No, it's pretty similar. I mean, but. Really, I don't know if that's why. No, that's the reasoning behind the open office plans. Did you not know that? That like because no, I didn't. Because if if you're not aware of whether or not anyone's looking at you when you're working, your productivity goes up because you're like in this perpetual state of anxiety as to whether or not like you're going to be discovered slacking off, which is the whole point of like the Panopticon, and that's why like every no no oh that makes sense. I didn't. But is there productivity maxing thing is created? the open office plan because it's a panopticon. That's why like you have to have your camera on when you're working from home now, right? Is is that uh, something that they uh did consciously? I mean is there a direct connection? Did somebody read uh 
Discipline and punish or whatever. Oh, I mean, let me see. Open office plan, pen, Opticon. I'm I because I know like Bloomberg is famous for like that's Bloomberg's thing or whatever. I mean, did were is is he reading uh discipline and punish and like implementing this like actively? I don't know. Is it just or is it just? I assume so. Oh my god. I mean, this is like this is like how it just goes. Like this is like like the Mossad reading deluge and shit. Like all of this stuff is like they they take what they can from it. Yeah, uh, and you know the this is the whole thing about the workhouses too. Because I don't know if if you've looked into workhouses previously, you know about how they work or the horror stories about them. But they're like really fucking bad. Uh, you know, they're like the way that they're set up. I mean. You know, there, it's, uh, this is the solution to the charity problem of needing to like feed the homeless. I'm surprised they haven't done this in San Francisco or whatever yet. But you know, you'd basically be imprisoned for real in the place called the workhouse, and it's like set up and designed like a, a prison, and it's like a lot of them look like panopticons, and they're very rigidly structured, and the conditions are very poor, and the poor, you know, paupers have to go there instead of being given charity. Uh, you know, to keep them under control and to manage the population of the poor and to uh, make sure that they understand the principles of economics. Uh, and so they have to do this, you know, uh, menial like labor at these prisons in order to get their subsistence. And it's like the lowest quality of life possible. And they, you know, sep- are separating, uh, you know, children. Uh, from their families and you know uh, lots of horror stories in the history of this it's you know very uh, you know anyone who knows about it is probably not a supporter of the history of workhouses you know maybe in theory if you've studied uh, economics uh, in only in abstract sense anybody who knows the actual history of this is is probably pretty aware of the horror of it it's not a good thing but this is what uh, Darwin is uh, using his uh you know, evolutionary theory and support of this is this is what's being yoked to. Okay, so the open office comes from fucking Frank Lloyd Wright, apparently. Really? That's what I'm reading here. I had no idea. I didn't even know that. I mean, this is like you know, industrial design is like what really drives everything, right? No, it absolutely is because this is uh, you know the principle but behind all. Yeah, the Larkin Administration Building. <laughs> in New York <laughs> is the first case of um, the open office plan. Let's see who worked there. Oh my god. The Larkin Soap Company. The L- <laughs> oh wait, yeah, wait, this, here we go. This what? is good. What? Between its support peers, 14 seats, uh, 14 sets of three inscription words each such as generosity, altruism, sacrifice, integrity, loyalty, fidelity, imagination, judgment, initiative, intelligence, enthusiasm, control, cooperation, economy, industry. That's what it read in the first kind of like Orwellian. It's kind of horrible. Yeah. It's the brave new world, literally. This is the Fabian society. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but this is like exactly what they're, this is exactly what Darwin is doing. Right. This is his world that he's entering. Uh, after he comes back, the political fortunes of his family have changed after 1832. Everybody's talking about Malthus. The argument here is that, uh, you know, you need to uh, basically con- put a level of control on the poor because they're breeding too much. And there's this is the Malthusian argument of it is there's not enough, uh, you know, arable land, that there's not enough agricultural surplus. And this is, you know, especially in England, all then rooted back into their, you know, uh, idea of the republic and the, the commercial republic. And this is what Britain is trying to, you know, do internationally is they're trying to be huge, uh, you know, commercial uh, enterprise with, you know, uh, running all these these different companies all over the world, right? And so they can't feed the poor because you know they're an industrial nation, and uh, you know they they don't have an agricultural base. That's the whole idea of it. So you know all this has a deep economic history, and uh, now they're facing the consequences of that, and that they're you know dealing with all these poor people. How do you control them? How do you keep them from breeding? And basically, I guess what well, well, not not just that though, because like this is this is what's interesting about like the Fabian Society and stuff is that they're kind of against the uh, the position of like the hereditary nobility and these sorts of things. Like they're not really that sort of reactionary. 
um, because they think that there's like degeneration or like, you know, decline to the mean in the genetic population of like the top. So what they really want is like max, like the ability for to like sort out the best of the poor, right? And to have them move up into society while still and allowing for like the hereditary nobility and these things to decline and, um, and to like fall into the poor. Oh. Because so they do, they want like social mo- like movement. And what I mean, because they are socialists. I mean, this is what I was reading about. Um, uh, they also have a lot of metaphors that they employ. They develop a lot of ideas about uh, the organic kind of qualities of, of the state. Uh, and this is what they're worried about is the, you know, corruption uh, of the organism of society. And they, they, they feel like the, the breeding of the poor is kind of like the rot that's going on within the organism. And so they're trying to, I guess, control that. And well, they tie it also to like you know that the that like the 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 old elite aren't like capable. Like they're also degenerate, right? So you've got the degenerate poor, and you've got the degenerate elite. And what you really need is to have like the the middle class, right? The the like bourgeois <laughs> fundamentally uh-huh. um, to to take over, to move up. And that's like why we have the education systems we have now and stuff. It's to organize and like separate the like lower orders from like the potential like you know future entrepreneurs or whatever gifted gifted the gifted students gifted students yeah but uh, i guess with the fabian specifically i mean uh, you know they're they're dealing with these events called like bloody sunday and a lot of these kinds of uh uh you know social disorder that's happening in the later 19th century um they're they're suffering the consequences because they're starting out as like revolutionary socialists, right? That's the, the origin of the Fabian Society, but they're moving away from that really quickly because uh, they they realize they they have a string of failures or disappointments in the history of what they're doing uh, in the later 19th century with all the socialists. There's a lot of high profile kind of martyrs and, and deaths and tragedies that are going on, uh, and uh, they have like. Incidents where like William Morris is like giving the eulogies at these funerals, uh, and you know it's a whole affair. Uh, but this is really influencing the development they take towards technocracy uh, because they realize kind of the failure of this socialist idealism and socialist utopianism and uh, revolutionary socialism, and so they make a conscious decision, um, you know, basically to adopt a managerial approach and to infiltrate liberal institutions. And the leaders of the Fabians, the, you know, the core of it are these, uh, Philip, Philip Webb and his wife, right? They're, they're at, you know, the center of it. They're kind of like the plotters. They're, uh, be behind it all. And so, you know, this is, this is their master plan is then to set up stuff like uh, the London School of Economics, right, to train these uh, technocrats to infiltrate liberal institutions. This is this is the real history of the the, the socialism that we're talking about. This is where socialism comes from. This is what ultimately ends up influencing America. It's you know uh, very kind of difficult history to wrap your wrap your head around, but this is like what. You know, all this stuff is leading up to with, you know, Malthus and Darwin and well, like, and everything else. The irony, right, is that it used to be like if you were a Darwinian, you would be like that was like a synonym for being a socialist. Yeah. Like that's how it was because the the the, the landed aristocracy still believed in, um, you know, their like essentially like, you know, God granted uh, royal bloodlines or whatever are still supposed to be the ones in charge. Whereas then you have like the utilitarian or like the merit, which is the same thing as like a meritocratic idea, which is that of like the middle classes, which are like produced in industrialization. And they are the ones who have to uh, like ascend in rank and they have to like prove their value. They're not like born valuable, but everyone has to like prove their value through working and like creating um, something beneficial or whatever, or like, you know, it, being an entrepreneur, being a, a, an industrialist, any of these sorts of things, um, you know, because it proves like your intelligence 
And that, that way you like rise up through the things. That's why we have like, I, that's like, you know, the SATs were originally just like IQ tests and things. And this is sort of what like a lot of people on the right or whatever are in favor of ultimately is like a more like merit. They would say it's like a more meritocratic idea that like, that's why they don't like diversity hiring and stuff. Because it's like different levels. Oh yeah, bio Leninism. Yeah, by like yeah, as they say, well, bio Leninism. What they really should be saying, if they were actually in interested in like the terms, would be panmixia. Yeah, which is what Spencer is uh, afraid of. Which is that you know, um, if you don't have a social structure that sorts out like the good genes from the bad genes, then you have like a whole, a whole like descent to the mean. And that's what everyone's talking about when they're talking about like national IQ scores and stuff like that. And that's their justification for, you know, like immigration, um, uh, anti, you know, all this sort of stuff. But they don't, you know, this has a very weird kind of development in order to get to this place. You know, it's it's so strange because it's like nobody even uh, recognizes this. It's all kind of lost. Is that they think this is all like this like right wing idea or whatever? But it's so uh, you know, it's a very middle class uh, you know in uh, you know uh, industrialist political economy kind of idea. It's like Victorian cybernetics. Is the whole thing of it is that you know it's built into this utilitarian theory. Is that you you know the utilitarian theory here is. Uh, you know, like we're talking about with uh, Robinson Crusoe economy, um, is that it is moving towards a completely subjective model of preferences and utility. It's all just based around you know abstracting uh, the the good of somebody, basically of like what what's good for them or what they want, what makes them happy. Uh, and the utilitarians are framing this in like a really positive light. And there's actually one of the few books I was able to find on uh, utilitarianism and the history of it is called like uh, the Happiness Philosophers, and it's this huge uh, you know defense of the utilitarianism because they're trying to basically just make everybody happy is the way that it's framed, right? Yeah, uh, and that's is kind of the idea of it because that's what utility is supposed to represent is uh, you know utility is this abstracted notion when economics isn't. Economics isn't dealing with uh, money in that sense of like people maximizing their finances. It's their decisions are uh, an attempt to maximize their utility functions and maximize their utility, which is uh, you know representative of their uh, abstracted uh, happiness or uh, you know satisfaction or, or contentment, contentment or something like that, right? And this is what utility represents an abstraction that's designed to capture that. Yeah. I mean, this is like an ultimate, like in like its modern form, like what utilitarianism really is, is uh, you get to Rawls. Like the real, yeah. the real thing is like Rawls is like undergirds so many people's understandings of things, even like subconsciously. Like people will posit like the original position and things. And I think that like video games particularly have made people mm. think of uh the world as like, you know, it's about like Min Max. Uh you're you're rolled into the world and like at what what are your stats and things or like what's a what's a game a balanced game um for your uh, character optimization, what what build are you running? Uh, stuff like that. I mean, it's like this is literally how people think about it's a, a very pernicious kind of metaphor, especially with the video games that, that comes about. The, but you know, this kind of min-max idea of like we're going to min-max the utility of everybody, and this is how uh, utilitarian economic theory is developing with the idea of like marginal utility and when post and you know post classical or neoclassical econ- economics. This is where it's coming from. Is that that's all based around people literally min-maxing their utility functions to, you know, yeah. Uh, get, get. I mean, the problem with the like, I think Nozick still has the best like argument against utilitarianism because he comes up with the concept of the utility monster, and that's just what I always think of when I think about like uh, like e- e- Epstein or something like that. That like what we really have is like like um, we have a society that's like ostensibly meritocratic, blah 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 blah. What it really is 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 that the maximization of like utility monsters. Who are, which are like the billionaires, right? Like these people, yeah. like they, they get to do anything they want. And like, you know, their lives are whatever they want them to be. They, they have like total, free, they have like follow no laws. They, you know, they're, they're like the, they're the crown jewel of like utilitarianism is like the production of utility monsters. <laughs> 
And this is actually a funny, a funny part of it too, because this goes into the the argument that they're having over poor houses and everything, right? Is that or workhouses? Is that uh, you know, with William Godwin and with like Erasmus Darwin, uh, they were having the arguments with Jeremy Bentham at the time about utilitarianism, and they were opposed to it, and they were arguing against you know Malthus. Or, you know, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Godwin was a utilitarian or considered to be a, a, one of the first utilitarians, but this, you know, representative of, of a very different model of it than what it ends up to be. And he's arguing against Darwin, or no, he's arguing against um, uh, Malthus about moral restraint is the the terms of the debate. And Malthus obviously is arguing that people can't control themselves when it comes to sexual reproduction, is that they're just going to like fornicate and, you know, as much as they want, and they're going to breed as much as they can, uh, and there's no controlling it, especially among the poor, and that's why there needs to be a system. Of- you can't possibly, like, produce, like, or them as, like, you know, human beings. Like, they're born into, like, their class yeah. status. They're born with, like, you know, their bad genes or whatever, as other people would put it. And, you know, that's all that can be done with them is to just, like, manage their potential damage. Which is, like, really the, the logic, like, that's not, the, the logic of our welfare systems wasn't to, you know, make people's lives better, but to, like, manage a, a class of population. That's it. Yeah. Uh, this is the important thing to realize because uh, they're going ultimately throwing out this idea from the early utilitarianism of like Godwin of any sort of moral restraint of people you know being able to exercise a higher level of control over their animal kind of uh, you know desires desires and this organizations of their of their biologies like their biologies organized in this way in order to compel them to sexually reproduce. And people can't, there's no higher level, uh, you know, legislation there, legislative ability to, you know, executive function in order to control that. The idea is fundamentally that the economy separates people Mm -hmm. who have such an ability from the ones who don't. So this is like, you know, this is like the social Calvinism really beneath it all, where it's like if you've like been able to... Um, you know, you solve, you, you pass the marshmallow test or whatever. Oh my God. Somehow, like from birth or whatever, you've always passed the marshmallow test. And, um, that means that, like, you're gonna, you're like gonna be selected and sorted out as like one of the gifted kids, right? And then you'll make your way into like your proper position in society because it's meritocratic and everything sorts perfect. Like, you know, uh, the, the economic calculus is like done perfectly well and if you don't make it up there then you know it's proof that like you're a degenerate and like you know you have like you know you weren't a capable you were you you, you didn't have the the genetic instinct to do the to right pass thing the marshmallow test. yeah to pass the marshmallow test uh, and this is the sad thing about it really uh, it's a very uh, you know this is what people like Nick Land and everyone believe at, at the end is the, the this very reductionist animalistic uh, kind of imposition on humanity that reject- the question though is always like what position are you in to even like you have to posit like if you're positing like man as an animal or whatever then what is the being that is positing this yeah like is it an animal like can an animal posit itself as an animal like obviously not so it doesn't really make any fucking sense like yeah uh, but this is like the abstracted kind of uh you know uh viewpoint that all of this is is based on and it's like this is the lovecraftian uh cosmic pessimism of it all is that oh man can we go into that for a little though because that was a huge scandal right when we were show, like you know all of his uh late letters or co- were getting coming out where he like oh yeah that's great i'm gonna do record a show with the you know my the the guy who's translating or publishing transcribing and publishing those right now because I love those. I read all of those like when I was younger because they, they were at the library like it's like an out of print edition but I always loved his letters and I recommended them but a lot of the people who read Lovecraft are like they, they kind of buy into the nonsense that's attached to like his earlier career as like you know a utilitarian like pessimist fundamentally. Yeah and this is exactly what I brought up with this guy uh, Henry Sidgwick. It was another utilitarian moral philosopher and this is like the argument of the utilitarians that they're using is literally that it's from the uh, perspective of the universe or whatever. There is a they're morally emptying out the content of everything and reducing it down into uh you know a game uh, yeah it's like 
so nothing, there's no metaphysical value, there's no aesthetic value in anything, there's no moral value in anything that you believe or, you know, what your utility function is, right? So all these people, uh, you know, who are having these debates online today and are trying to take these really firm moral positions and hold, like, the moral high ground over people and beat people over their head with how good they are and how much they care about every little thing, uh, you know, they're ultimately all uh, utilitarians in the sense is that, you know, the whole way all this works is that it literally doesn't care about what the content of any of this is, what your beliefs are. It's like literally like what what HP Lovecraft stories are about is like what yeah. if like all of the information in the world was just like legible to you and you could have like perfect understanding. And what he's really talking about is like that feel when like you read Malthus and you get black pilled. <laughs> And then you realize like you have to like you have to have like a cold discare for like the poor and that like actually they're like demons who worship uh, Cthulhu and they need to be wiped out. <laughs> no, this is exactly the whole point of, of what Lovecraft's, uh, you know, pessimist, his cosmic nihilism or whatever is actually about. This is what it concerns. Is that it's the utilitarian perspective of, you know, uh, this this rational kind of consciousness that's uh, out there in the universe somewhere. It's observing humanity with indifference. And it doesn't care about any of our moral or cultural values on any deeper level, right? And if you don't worship it, it'll kill you though. Because, you know, but then, you know, we can't talk about how there's a right side of history or progress or anything. No, no, no. It's just, uh, you know, it's all very confusing when you get these these uh, these uh, neo-reactionaries who are just fucking liberals. And they're like talking about like how Unitarians are the problem or something. And it's like their entire worldview comes from like these Unitarian circles that created utilitarianism. Mm -hmm. Because this is literally just utilitarianism. And this is the problem with utilitarianism is that, you know, it's adopting this perspective to then uh, mark us all as animals. Uh, And, you know, that's... And it treats us like that. Yeah. And that's what sets sets us all up for. And this is also, it's all based around, uh, you know, the main drivers of everything is pleasure and pain. Uh, And it's just like, does something cause you pleasure or pain? Uh, You know, does it maximize your utility function, bring you more pleasure? It's a very uh, Epicurean kind of notion. It's, uh, you know, very connected to all these hedonistic kind of philosophies through history in a lot of ways. Yeah. And like, ultimately what it is, is like you, like all these people, they just look at what, like degeneracy, right? And they go like, well, I can restrain my, my desires to like feel immediate pleasures. Therefore I'm part of like God's elect and like non is smiling upon me because my children shall inherit the earth. Right. That's uh, that's it. And, but this is also all contained within that all contained within these theories is first of all, I want to make the point that, uh, this is a cosmological shift that's happening during this time. Like we were talking about before with, you know, the Copernican universe and the balance of power that is being worked out is that Darwin and Malthus are also contributing to a uh, cosmological change in the same way where they're bringing in all of these statistical methods and a new kind of science. Uh, you know, with this natural law kind of philosophy that we were talking about before, it's all rationalist. And that's what rationalism really is. It, it, it's, that's what's referring to is that they're using a rational deductive analysis to, uh, you know, figure what these laws are out of concepts just by thinking about them, right? And they just reason about them and then they come up with all these laws, which they claim are, you know, the objective nature of things. So whenever anybody talks about nature, first of all, that's what, usually what they're talking about. But Darwin and Malthus are uh, making a change in this and that they're replacing this kind of rationalism with this, uh, you know, pretense of uh, scientific empiricism and calculation and precision and statistics. And the the funny thing about that is that this actually plays right into the uh, outcome of the Congress of Vienna, which is the the sort of this is the piece that brings end to the Napoleonic Wars. And this is where it all actually enters into things uh, is in the partition of Poland, is that they actually are using these uh, statistical you know, population demographic methods in order to divide uh, you know, Poland between Prussia and Russia. And this is where it all begins. This is like the... The system then that, you know, Darwin and Malthus are ultimately, you know, uh, that's the ideology that they're forming through the Congress of Vienna. And it's actually really 
interesting here because the Congress of Vienna adopts as its formal position for the international behavior of uh, the participants is that they're all going to be grounded in a program of uh, improvement is what they call it, of uh, colonial improvement and imperialistic improvement. So that becomes this whole the driving factor in all of this colonial activity in the 19th century is this uh, outcome of the Congress of Vienna, which is this ideology that we're going to, you know, go to Rhodesia or whatever, uh, and, you know, we're going to improve everything there through our colonial government, and we're going to make everybody happier according to utilitarianism, and, uh, you know, the world utility is going to be raised, uh, and that's the the thinking behind it all. And this is the world cosmology that, you know, Things like Darwinism are using being used to uh, build up. It's very you know uh, goes very deep in that it really is literally replacing this earlier kind of rationalistic natural law in a very meaningful way. Is that it's substituting out all these different concepts, and that you know uh, Malthus and, and Darwin are, are literally filling in for these concepts of sociability and and uh, you know you know the inherent want and need that man finds himself in and. This is, uh, you know, uh, the basis of everything. Really, Darwin is uh, the the ideology of modern commerce. Pretty explicitly. I mean, that's like how people talk about it, right? Like, yeah. it's all taken this way. It's, it's like metaphorically useful for certain... I mean, this is like how uh, a lot of AI work, stuff works now, is that they'll, like, do um, natural selection, basically. Yeah. Uh, by, like, you know, they just, like, iterate... Mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, kill things off. And this is like the idea that this is like natural law itself. And so then... It's the, how the GAN works, yeah. And so then, you know, if you're just simulating natural law and pr- to produce intelligences, then you can produce like superhuman intelligences. And this is like the faith of the fucking AI people. Yeah, so if you can... If you know that intelligence is the product of natural selection of the laws of nature, then if you modify nature in a simulation, then you can produce any result that you want. Uh, you know, that that kind of thinking. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. but I think what it will probably do is just make maximize the fucking hell world that we already, like, like this idea that an AI would have the, would be able to quantify any, like, these sort of abstract things that we kind of value in ways that we can't um, describe in utilitarian calculus. Like, why would an AI give a shit if you, like, think that your life is miserable, if it makes you work more? Yeah. And that's, like, been your deputed position. And it's so interesting because a lot of computational history, like uh, we talked about, is rooted in, in this, too. Not only in, you know, the Babbage, but then also in this guy who is introducing the uh, Robinson Crusoe economy, too, is that he is a, you know, pioneer in computation as well. Uh, and that he's actually making something called the logic piano is his invention. Uh, and he's adopting uh, logic from uh, Mill. Is J.S. Mill's his, his basis for this. And he, his name is, uh, uh, this is Jevons again. You can go look up a picture of this little logic piano. William Stanley Jevons' logic piano. Uh, it's a very weird little device. But basically the principle of it is that it's a, an implement, it's a mechanical implementation of a Boolean truth table. Uh, and really, I was, found this really fascinating is that it's actually, this is exactly what Claude Shannon is doing, uh, who is making the computer possible in the 1940s when he writes his dissertation about uh, basically Boolean uh, algebra being able to solve the problem of circuit design, of designing an electronic circuit. So he basically realizes that an electrical circuit can be an actual physical one-to-one manifestation of a Boolean like logic, you know, diagram, and that's that's what allows the computer to work. Is that you know, they, it turns out that they're, they're the same thing, or it can be reduced to the same thing. And so Jevons is actually during the Victorian era, uh, you know, working on the exact same problem with you know Boolean algebra and implementing it using a mechanical system. Uh, and so with him and with Babbage, then it's like that's it, you know, really it is 
I would say Victorian cybernetics in that sense is that I mean I think I think it's like the historical parallels are pretty similar though because a lot of like just the social milieu or the background of the people who are um, you know the most like plugged into this sort of like uh, like the the fucking Boolean logic people the rationalist community that undergirds a lot of like what the neo reactionaries or you know um, the even the ones like anyone who even knows that that exists right mm-hmm. is kind of a part of this um, this tech class this like computer working class that has emerged yeah now like with the with like the elimination of the industrial economy like it's not like industrialists or whatever that are generally the people who are writing these sorts of things these are like the it's like the silicon valley ideology yeah it's very similar uh, you know in a lot of ways cuz this the, the way that the poor houses are being set up then based around darwin is you know that's the whole cybernetic feedback system that is you know being used after World War II is that it's the pleasure and pain model of utilitarianism, and that's the feedback system that cybernetics uses. Is that it sets up these feedback uh, you know control mechanisms based on pleasure and pain uh, in institutions that uh, you know uh, function according to these like game theoretic models of uh, you know. Uh, Utility incentives. I mean, you play a game, and the winner of the game each turn, or, or, or you know, based on your moves, you get a payout of your utility, and you're trying to maximize that, right? And you know, uh, you have these models like Nash equilibrium and stuff, which explain like the best way that people can maximize that. And it turns out that you can use a competitive game system, uh, you know, as an abstract model in that sense in order to coordinate people's behavior in a competitive way. So you don't even need any anybody in this sense to, uh, you know, be, uh, you don't need to, uh, to, to direct them in a top-down way at all. You don't need to give commands. You don't need to plan things out. You set up these cybernetic system loops uh, like a workhouse, right? And if you want to control the, the breeding levels of the poor and control their population... Uh, you know, you just set up a pleasure and pain kind of utilitarian incentive structure of rewards and punishments. Uh, and then, you know, it teaches them or forces them in order to, you know, survive in that system and maximize their utility. It forces them to uh, produce the outcomes that you want them to produce. And they, they you know, the, the, the poor people, the paupers in this workhouse situation, they don't need to understand any of that in order for it to work. But it coordinates their behavior. I mean, that's how everything works, right? That's like how Twitter works. It's how Facebook works. But you can literally be on on Twitter and tell somebody that and say, like, well, actually, the internet is actually designed by, like, uh, you know, Paul Barron and like packet switching at Rand, and like this is like where it all fucking comes from, and it's literally designed based on these principles, uh, and they will not believe you still. I literally, this literally just happened today. So I mean, it's like the uh, people just want to be told like what they can do in a way mm-hmm. so that like they want you to say like there's some sort of action you can take that will suddenly like somehow contribute to the opposite of this the world that they're in. So this can be like you know tweeting about the degeneracy of the bad people or whatever. But like ultimately, all of these ways that people the most popular ways are ones that just like fit perfectly into the this logic already. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, if you start telling people like, well, you know, it's actually really hard. It's really complicated. You have to like, you know, do a lot of history. You've got to read a lot to figure out like what the fuck you're even talking about here. Um, that's not, that's not going to help because that's like work. And what people want is something to do that'll give them like, you know, the pleasure response or whatever. That's it. But this is exactly how Twitter is designed because you get your dopamine. Literally. Yeah. And then that's your utilitarian feedback mechanism. And that basically controls your engagement is they don't care at all about what you're really posting about. I mean, I feel like a lot of the, you know, censorship issues that people get into and whatever is, you know, uh, ultimately Twitter doesn't really care about any of that. Is, no, I mean, Richard Spencer has his account. Like, yeah. uh, well, the way, like the way that it's chosen or not is like totally arbitrary. It's really more about like, like, like that stuff doesn't really matter. Like, yeah, they don't, the whole point is that none of this cares about the content of anything. No, there's no logic to it. Like, it's the logic of your behavior. It's trying to control your behavior, the structure or form of your behavior. And it doesn't really care about what your ideas are because from this perspective, the, the Lovecraftian, uh, you know, nihilist utility monster, uh, Cthulhu creature 
is that that doesn't care about what you believe at all. Uh, you know, that's the point. Yeah. Does the does the content get like you know clicks pretty much? And like I don't know the, what I've always sort of felt like I'm doing or what I'm trying to do is to like uh, poison people's uh, utilitarian calculus. So like I like you know like people like that's what I think is like the beneficial part of like what used to be trolling and stuff. Nowadays everyone's just kind of feeding into. Um, you know, I get called a contrarian for this or whatever, but I'm trying to just like upset the loops of people's like utilitarian calculus here where they're just like pressing the button over and over. I'm trying to like break that. <laughs> There's not much you can really do to, uh, you know, uh, affect this. I mean, you know, you need to start thinking way outside of the, uh, outside of the confines about any of this. This is why we're, I guess, uh, you know, it's good to actually get into this history. I mean, we talk about all this stuff in this episode. It's like I feel like we barely even touch the fucking surface though, because it goes first. It's like yeah, it's like you have to explain fucking everything. Like it goes everywhere. It's like this is just like the fucking world, man. It's everything. You can't just pick pick and choose little pieces of it. You got to have like a really wide view of the developments of these things in time, because you can see that it's continuous. I mean, I feel like looking into this more and more is like you can literally see how, uh, you know, Francis Bacon or like Leibniz or, or they're kind of like basically doing the same thing as like, you know, John von Neumann or, or you know, cybernetic designers at the Macy conferences. Or, you know, it's very, uh, you know, it's a continuous history that we're caught up into and, you know, nothing just comes out of nowhere. And I guess, I mean, this is, we'll go into it more in, in later shows. I mean, uh, just, you know, we covered a lot of historical ground, but I think it's like just good background that I will. Yeah. So now we're supposed to like wrap up and tell people to do something. Um, yeah, I don't care. Do whatever. Oh, yeah. Somebody, I think I saw somebody complain about that on the last show. People complain all the time about that. They're like, yeah, but what are we going to, what can you do about it? And it's like, I don't fucking know, man. What do you want to do? What are you doing? What is anybody else doing that's claiming to be doing anything? Not not anything. Uh, so I don't know. Just join us in the research project. I mean, yeah, start reading books and send me like good shit. Yeah, I mentioned a bunch of the, the books that we were reading. This is why I like the Baconian thing, though, right? It's like I'm not trying to be a big deal. I'm not trying to do anything. I'm trying to be the new Atlantis Island, <laughs> like just working in secret. Yeah. No, I, like I don't want to attract too much attention. I just want to like put together the foundations for something in the future that I won't probably even see. That's it. Uh, maybe I'll list the books that you, people could check out. I mean, ones that I looked at were like The Emergence of Scientific Culture, Science and the Shaping of Modernity, uh, 1210 to 1685. There's this one, The Political Descent about Malthus. There's uh, Scientific Cosmology. Uh, which I thought was really a good one. Uh, oh, we didn't. I thought we were gonna do a thing on uh, on uh, the confidence man and stuff, but oh, we yeah. can do that another time. That'll be good. Yeah, we need to do a whole uh, show about the because uh, that will be a good show just on its own because that's a whole other world of looking into the financial kind of narratives. Oh yeah, uh, there's actually a lot there. The, I found a whole book that I showed you about that, but that would be a great one to kind of look at. And, you know, yeah, we can do that one next. Yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, and so we'll be doing more of more of these. Uh, Pain, Pleasure, and the Greater Good by Kathy Gear. Uh, you know, from political economy to economics through 19th century literature. Uh, Robinson Crusoe's Economic Man, a construction and deconstruction. I mean, there's lots of good stuff out there. Uh, people always ask me, where do you find books? Uh, I always feel kind of stupid answering because I don't think it's that mysterious. Uh, I don't claim to have any special techniques. But basically, uh, you can find books by looking in the catalog for a library. Uh, you know, go to the, the Harvard Library website, Yale, uh, University of Chicago, any top university website. Uh, look in the catalog. They have advanced filter options. You can search by subject and, and date and, you know, whether it's a book or a paper or anything like that. Uh, and you can just build your own bibliography and, uh, you know, get the books, look them up on Libgen, see if they're on archive. Uh, get the ones that match what you're looking for. Liberate the JSTOR stuff on Sci-Hub. Yeah, and uh, then, you know, go in those books. Every book at the, basically at the end of the book, probably before the index, there's a section called the bibliography, which lists all the books that the author used. Uh, and then you can look through that and find other books that relate to what you're trying to find. And that's how I find books for things. So, uh, you know, do that and look at some of the ones we mentioned on this episode and, you know, 
that's the that's what we're up to. So that's how you can actually do something, I guess. It's you know you're not saving the world here, but uh, this is better than what everybody else is doing because we're actually uh, or you know uh, yell at yell at something like you know be mad, <laughs> be mad or be happy about something. I don't know. Fucking I don't care. <laughs> but uh, thank you, Lo- Logo, for sure.